Good morning, everybody. Let's kick this off by talking about something extremely critical, shaving your balls. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped, and they just released the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right. The Lawnmower 4.0. And you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code CLEAREDHOT at manscaped.com. What is this fantastic tool, you may ask yourself? Well, it's a sleek, well-designed, and optimized body hair trimmer that says, your balls will thank you, on the box. It's the fourth generation trimmer with cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. You might ask yourself, how is this different from other trimmers? Well, the upgraded trimmer includes a multifunction on off switch that can engage a travel lock because nobody wants that rattling around in their bag. It gives you the ability to turn on a 4000K LED spotlight so you could shave your balls in the dark. No more need to put on night vision goggles to do this. And it allows you to customize the trim length with new one through four shearing sizes. It's got a wireless charging system that uses electromagnetic induction, which can help battery length last longer. Manscaped has a bunch of other products in addition to the Lawnmower 4.0. They have cologne, crop mop, ball wipes, crop reviver ball toner, and crop preserver ball deodorant. For all the females listening, you'll appreciate this part. Manscaped products are cruelty-free, paraben-free, dye-free, and vegan. 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com using the code CLEAREDHOT. That is manscaped.com, promo code CLEAREDHOT. This episode is also brought to you by Athletic Greens, the single most comprehensive daily nutritional beverage that I've ever tried and implemented into my life. Could not be easier. Think of this as nutritional insurance. One scoop of Athletic Greens contains 75 vitamins and minerals, whole food sourced ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more. They all work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet, increase your energy and focus, aid with digestion, and supports a healthy immune system, all without the need to take multiple products. This stuff is lights out good in smoothies, and it's actually not that bad if you just mix it in water. Athletic Greens is obsessive about improvement and making the best product possible. This is their 53rd iteration over the last decade and counting. They do third-party testing to ensure that their customers receive the highest quality and best daily new nutritional habit on the planet. Right now, Athletic Greens is doubling down on supporting your immune system. They're offering a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit with the link today. You'll basically never have to buy vitamin D again. So whether or not you're looking for peak performance or better health or just covering your bases nutritionally, Athletic Greens makes it simple to invest in your energy and immunity and gut health every single day. Visit athleticgreens.com slash cleared hot and join health experts, athletes, health conscious go-getters, and a lot of other people around the world who are just trying to do better every single day. Athleticgreens.com slash cleared hot. Get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. This episode is also brought to you by Element, a delicious electrolyte drink mix designed to support active hydration and a healthy lifestyle. I am super fortunate to be very good friends with one of the founders of this company, Rob Wolf. Um, And if you're curious about how intelligent he is and why I'm stoked he's involved with this company, go back and listen to the episodes with which I have had him on. This is all about replacing electrolytes and enhancing your performance. The best performers in the world are using Element. I'm talking about Team USA weightlifting, NBA teams, NFL teams. It says on here the Navy SEALs, but listen, don't do anything just because the SEAL community does it. We do some really dumb stuff, but the list goes on and on and on. In addition to replacing electrolytes, you know, you want more energy while you're low carb dieting or intermittent fasting. You want to crush your next workout. How about your next work day? Element has the electrolytes that you're looking for to make this happen. Delicious flavored. Right, you can go to the website. They just came out with a watermelon, and they have another one that's getting ready to come out, or it just released. It is grapefruit, and damn, it is delicious. If you're looking to up your game, if you're looking to find a simple way to replace electrolytes, I have these things every single day. They cut, they're conveniently come in single-serving uh, little packets. They're awesome. I have them in bags. I have them in my car. I have them everywhere. If you're looking to get involved with this, which you should be, go to drink normal spelling, lmnt.com slash cleared hot, and use the promo code cleared hot. Again, drink lmnt.com slash cleared hot, promo code cleared hot. And here's the last thing. Element, they might have the best return policy on the planet. If you don't love it for any reason, instantly refund it. Last, but absolutely not least, this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. If you're hearing this and something is interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving whatever goals you may have, BetterHelp is here to help you. 
They will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating in under 48 hours. This is not a crisis line, and this is not self-help. This is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which you might not have locally, depending on where you live. And because it's based on the internet, the service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime. You can send a message to your counselor. And what you're going to get is a timely and thoughtful response. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, whatever work best for you. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. And I always say this when I talk about counseling. Don't be surprised if the first person you talk to, they're not a great fit. If they are, spectacular. But if not, don't give up on the process. Find somebody that fits you better. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit BetterHelp.com slash cleared hot. That is BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash cleared hot and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash cleared hot. And that is all on the business side of the house. My guest today is a journalist and author, Wesley Morgan. And he wrote a book called The Hardest Place, The American Military Adrift in Afghanistan's Petch Valley. I've been to this valley, in and out of the valley, not an extended period of time. Wesley has spent substantially more time there and done much more research than I ever had. I actually learned more about the country that I deployed to sitting down and speaking with him and reading his book than I had actually walking around with my own two feet looking around. Wesley's story to me is crazy. At 19, uh, instead of, you know, going off to college, he, you know, started going off to Iraq to do reporting and then went back to Iraq and then back to Iraq again, and then Afghanistan, and back and forth, and then to Afghanistan multiple times. He was actively seeking out places that most would choose to not go. He wrote a book about his experience and the U.S. experience in the Petch Valley, and I cannot recommend it enough, especially for those who served there. It will give you a better perspective of what the U.S. has been doing right and what the U.S. has been doing wrong. And I will leave you with that. Episode number 187 with Wesley Morgan. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a man, they give it to me, I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. Dude, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Round two of uh, trying to get you up here. Yes. Yeah. I apologize for uh, for the delay last for being time. sick. Yeah. yeah exactly. I don't. I don't yeah. think you need to apologize for <laughs> being sick, especially in a pandemic. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> How long have you lived in D.C.? I lived there like a decade. Okay. Yeah. Um, which it seems like it's about how long you spent in Afghanistan, which we will get to that. <laughs> what led you to D- uh, D.C. though? Where'd you Where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up in the Boston area, Watertown, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, Are you it, a mass hole or a normal person? You know, I'd say I'm a I'm a non practicing Massachusetts sports <laughs> fan. I was raised in that faith, but haven't 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 practiced in a long time. They go deep, <laughs> potentially deeper than blood ties. <laughs> I love Boston. I actually did a few uh, trips up near the Boston area when I was at uh, Development Group. It's a place. Oh, yeah? It's yeah, there's a. I don't want to say Boston proper because although we did fly Little Birds, pretty much directly through downtown, which was awesome <laughs> at night, so we didn't cause too many issues. Uh, but it's it's a busier training area than you might think. Hmm. Yeah, they call it a rut, a realistic urban training. Interesting. That's what they used to call it. I have no uh-huh. idea what they call it now because I am what they call in the dictionary dated. <laughs> right. Yeah, my, uh, my current knowledge of what's going on in the military is limited. So born and raised in Beantown. Yep. Always wanted to be an author. Um, no, I mean, I guess that's something I was interested in, but I just was interested in military history. I was a you know military history nerd since I was a little kid, um, and it all seemed kind of theoretical until I was like 13 when 9-11 happened. Did your military history passion start with G.I. Joes? Uh, they are a big part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you what my favorite G.I. Joes were still. <laughs> Did you play more G.I. Joe or Cobra side of the house? I would. I adapted GI Joes for Vietnam scenarios. So, oh, really? So Cobra guys became VC. You okay, know. fair was, enough. You know, painting with uh, model paints and so on involved. Did you ever get your hands on the generation of GI Joes before the like the three and a half inch tall ones, the big boys? 
Uh, I had like a few of the big ones, but I was always much more into the the little guys. My one of my fondest memories growing up, my grandmother who has passed long, long ago, and her husband who passed. Man, I have long enough ago that I have like fleeting memories. That's how young I was. Both army, um, both officers in the army, one on the medical side, one on the supply side. They had some bitchin' full size GI Joes, and for me, <laughs> people right now are probably like, "What in the fuck are you talking about?" <laughs> Would you say they're about a foot tall? Yeah, about a foot. Yeah, but we're talking fabric, actual uniforms with buttons, uh, webbing belt, canteens. I don't think uh, maybe you could have actually put water in the canteen. Now I'm trying to think. Maybe. Yeah, but it was amazing. It's funny because they made uh, in the '90s, like when I was a kid, they they made 12 inch ones again, but they look really different. Like really? They, yeah, like they're huge and jacked compared to the the like sort of skinny '60s GI Joes. So they're more of I would call that the Marvel superhero <laughs> GI Joe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, that's in an interesting point because I remember those. They were. It's not like they were uh, out of shape, but they were normal proportions, <laughs> right? <laughs> As opposed to the tortoise shell abs and deltoids <laughs> and neck that are just connected. Gee, I wonder why they did that. I wonder where the influence <laughs> came from. All right, so that's good. You started off with GI Joe. That was a very, that was a very deep portion of my life as well. I yeah. remember one Christmas I woke up, I got the GI Joe base. Oh, totally. I remember, yeah, Christmas of like third grade. I had uh, my dad had gone to some GI Joe convention and found all this like old, all this yes. stuff for me. Yes. Yeah. And then one Christmas I got. I swear it was based off like the SR seventy one. Blackbird, that plane. I think it was I a Cobra plane, one. though. It was it was a bad guy plane. Yeah, I remember. And it had the one. little plane in the back that came off that's the tail. That's right. That's right. It's yeah. no big deal. The guy had a cousin who had that one. Yeah. <laughs> Can you? I mean, I can't speak for you. I know I don't have any of these anymore, <laughs> and I'm pissed. I didn't collect. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if my kids would have been interested in it, but that shit was cool. I would. Uh, I, I regret it. I, I like. I tore them all apart to you know turn them into little uh, you know mix and match so that they yeah. look more like a little Mac Vsog guy or a VC guy or something. So nothing would be preserved in you know collectible form. But you might find an audience for your modifications. <laughs> they might have. Even, they'd either be worthless or have uh, an even greater value. <laughs> right. <laughs> did uh, did your interest in the military did your parents serve at all do you have a family history of military service no nope. i mean both my grandfathers uh served in kind of the immediate post-world war ii era briefly um uh it was sort of more important part of one grandfather's identity than the others mm -hmm. um neither of my parents my parents are kind of um you know post-vietnam generation liberals yeah kinda, where they they did not expect a, a war obsessive to uh, be something they raised well you took a different path with it for sure you might I mean, again, I can't speak for you, but based on the book that you wrote, I, you're more you're obsessed with warfare for sure. <laughs> Specifically, the Pesh Valley, which uh, I was thinking about this the, the past few days. I don't even know how you describe that place. To be honest, it's hard to do verbally. It's hard to do with the written word. I think there's been some good documentaries. You know, the Korengal, which is obviously not exactly like it's neighboring, pretty goddamn close. Right. I considered it for the book purposes. I considered it sort of the Pesh Valley system, you know, because all these tributaries. I mean, play they into they it. connect largely, you yeah. know, the at the it's up at uh, what would it be Abad? Yeah, because which one's more north, Abad or Jabad? It's been um, a while. Jabad's a little Jabad's down farther in south, Nagarhar, right? Nagarhar. Yeah, and then Abad is the confluence of the Kunar and Pesh rivers. Yeah, um, and then the Korangal joins the Pesh at um, what became Cop, Michigan, Canigal. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know how to describe it, um, but I think you're more obsessed with. I mean. I was obsessed as a young person with wanting to go into the military. Right. I think you sound like, or based off my reading of your book, you're obsessed with the military and the history of the U.S. military, which I think I can speak for both of us is full of uh, blunders right. along the way. Perhaps uh, repeated mistakes. Uh, there have been uh, some that you see repeat themselves over and over, <laughs> whether it's this book or any yeah. other book about Afghanistan that takes the long view, long view I think you'd see uh, a lot of the same things. But you don't get a book like this unless you are obsessed. So I think that's a really good thing. Um, I'm curious, though, how your parents received it when you started actually going over to Afghanistan. <laughs> um, I, they were actually completely supportive and cool about it. I think I got some insight in later years about how unbelievably stressed out this made them and yeah. how you know they kind of kept that to themselves. Um, but yeah, I first went to Iraq as a 19-year-old freelancer in 2007, the summer of the surge. Um, and I think, uh, you know, they were they were pretty worried, but they they never tried to stop me or anything like that. Well, what exactly did you tell them you were going to be doing? 
I told them uh, I was going to go cover the surge for the Daily Princetonian. <laughs> <laughs> so you left some of the, well, you may not have known some of the finer details, but uh, you painted it with a broad brush, which probably helped them. <laughs> if you had gone into any level of specificity, they might have actually lost their minds. I mean, I had no idea what to expect. Yeah. I, um, I sort of, I had, had gotten this weird invitation uh, from the, the four-star general in the theater at the time uh, to come over and and cover the surge, but I sort of assumed they're not going to let a 19-year-old kid like out and in bed with infantry units and stuff. They're going to, you know, keep me at MNFI headquarters in Baghdad or something like that. But no, this was the height of the embedding era, uh, and they treated me like any other embedded journalist. They said, you know, go go pick your infantry battalions, go go see what's going on. So I want to dive super deep into that, but before we do, I want to talk about how you arrived at being a journalist in the first place. So having a passion for military history is. Uh, I think it's awesome. I, I certainly had it as well. But like I said, for a different expression, you went, you know, born and raised in Boston, I'm assuming high school, then college for journalism specifically? Um, there were uh, college journalism courses that I took. We didn't have a major in journalism. Uh, so I, I got a public policy degree, which just was kind of the program that allowed me to take a bunch of classes and a bunch of different stuff. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah. From a small college called Princeton, right? Right. Yeah. Mostly online. <laughs> now, now it is. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> what isn't? Yeah, no, that's uh, yeah. <clears throat> My higher education stopped at the twelfth grade. Just so we're clear, when we're having this conversation, it's funny people say, "Well, yeah, where'd you go to school?" And I'll just say, "Santa Cruz High School." Yeah, they're like, "No, no." After I'm like, "Yeah, that's that's it." Have you ever heard of a glass ceiling? I hit my head on top of that thing. Well, you have that uh, that interesting officer program. I'd never heard of that until uh, you many know, hadn't about your bio. Yeah, yeah, many hadn't, which is probably, if I'm being honest why I got selected. I feel like they had more billets available than applicants. And I took advantage of that in a year that, hey, they're like, you know, we need to promote some more. And these people all have a pulse. And I don't know if you found this out in your military uh, journeys and studies, but if you have a pulse and you stay in the military long enough, it'll get you far. The collar device will change on your shoulder or the middle of your camis, depending on what service you're in or the uniform. Okay. So you get out of that. Um, hold on though. There's no way you could have finished all that and still be 19. Well, so I started doing it during college. I started. Um, I was going to say actually the first the first patch trip was between my junior and senior years of college. Um, but so I went in 2007 Iraq, um, 2008. I took a I took a year off between my sophomore and junior years of college um, because I mean I think uh, in an impulse that a lot of a lot of people with experience in these wars can probably empathize with. I was afraid of missing it and had no idea that there was no real danger of missing anything. It was the just going to go on real. forever and ever and ever. So I was at the <laughs> I was in the initial invasion of Iraq in 2003. Mm -hmm. The God, I can only speak for myself and I have to be very clear when I talk about anything military related. I can only express my experiences and what I felt. I felt like many people thought it would be wham bam and then we were done. Yeah. So we got to get it all in. Yeah. And we never know when there's going to be another one. So this is it or nothing. Right. Fast forward more than a decade. I mean, obviously we were we were incorrect, but I think that feeling was everywhere from active duty people, people wanting to join the military. Yeah, it was real. It was palpable. And I think that FOMO has kind of presented itself at every stage along the way of these wars, because we always think it's going to end or it's we're drawing down or the mission is changing. And you see that in, you know, in the patch, you even see that with these big infantry battalions that sometimes they're kind of like, hey, this is the last rotation. We can do the big air assaults. Let's let's get them in. Yeah. Uh, but inevitably, there are more later. Countless more for <laughs> sure. OK, so you're 19 and the military reached out to you. Uh, well, the, the story is that um, I, uh, I I got in touch with David Petraeus, who was then the uh, at the time was a three star at Fort Leavenworth. And he has a, a Ph.D. from Princeton. He's very loyal to the institution. How did um, you get in touch with Senor Petraeus? I, I looked up his email address in the alumni directory because um, <laughs> I was starting. Yes. To write, I was starting to write for the school paper and they said, go interview an interesting alum. Um, and I, you know, I was aware of who he was. It didn't seem it didn't seem at that point like he was. Uh, you know, he, he and Rumsfeld were on the outs, supposedly. It didn't yep. seem like he was going to keep on advancing. Um, so I, you know, did this interview with him for the school paper about the counterinsurgency manual and all that. Uh, and then... Uh, Which, for people listening, he had a huge input on, we call it internally coin, or as right. you just described it, the counterinsurgency, really manual slash doctrine. And 
it started that that implementation was in Iraq, and then they eventually tried to apply that to Afghanistan. I was actually in 2010; it was my last deployment, and they really were trying to replicate the success that they had found with that in Iraq in Afghanistan. Very different result. Yeah, <laughs> you can can certainly say that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting to see over the course of the wars, you see these kind of top-down efforts to impose that type of counterinsurgency, and then you also see bottom-up bottom efforts all yeah. along the way of, you know, this Green Beret team or this Army Brigade or this Marine Battalion that kind of read all the same stuff back in 2004 or 2005 before there was a coin manual and start doing it on their own uh, with, you know, various degrees of success. Well, the concept, if you can take out the geography and topography, the concept seems like you should be able to take it wherever you want to. You have probably been to the Pesh. Actually, I know for a fact you've spent more time in the Pesh than me. <laughs> you know, one of the key components of counterinsurgency is you have to provide security for the local populace. Pack a lunch. Right. In, you know, Iraq, not easy, but in the major areas of, you know, Baghdad or even Fallujah or Mosul, you know, the war of the Western Euphrates River Valley. I find those challenges far more surmountable than trying to do any of the stuff that is littered throughout the book of, I'm going to call it a failed operation after failed operation after failed operation, largely because of the terrain. They right. can't even get to the places that they want to provide security. So therefore, you can't even achieve one of the primary steps that you have to do for counterinsurgency. Again, yeah. on paper, yeah. if you take away the geography and the topography, probably should work. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the deepest, there's so many problems that uh, you, know, you wind up seeing with COIN um, that in 2007 and 2008, in its heyday, weren't obvious. I mean, they were probably obvious to deeper thinkers than I was at the time as a kid just starting to see these wars. Um, but it was easy to be excited about what seemed like after years of just like, you know, Iraq falling apart, no results in Afghanistan. During the surge in Iraq, uh, you saw what seemed like, you know, real success. But the trick was that it was... Uh, it was not it was it was short term success. It was creating security. And then whether it worked or not depended on whether you could hand it off to somebody, Correct. whether there were Iraqi or Afghan troops who could sustain what you'd gotten going. And almost, you know, it, it, almost universally, the answer has been no. Although in Iraq, things have come full circle again and Iraq seems to be doing better. It does. Two decades later, <laughs> <laughs> which <clears throat> that's another important point when it comes to counterinsurgency. Time should not be mattered in days, weeks, or months. It's right. years at best, if probably not decades. Right. But there's a flip side to that too, which is uh, you know something that I that I observed um, with the patch is that yeah, on the one hand, you think okay, the only way to do coin is to commit long term. But there also is this phenomenon uh, anywhere that you've got foreign troops in an alien landscape, alien population, uh, where there's kind of a half life on people's willingness to deal with you. Yeah. Um, you know, as units rotate in, you kill people, you kill the wrong people, you kill the right people, but their relatives don't like it. Um, after after a pretty short time, um, people are not willing to forgive or forget the kinds of mistakes that often they were willing to forgive or forget uh, during the for the first few units that come through their neighborhood. And when we're talking specifically about Afghanistan, you have to rewind to a previous generation and a previous occupying nation. Right. It's not as if the Americans that were there and are still there to some degree were the first military that the Afghans have seen come through there. Yeah, I mean, right, absolutely. I, I didn't count up, um, but there were references to, you know, well, actually, yeah, when we first got over there, Russian maps. Right, Gee, exactly. I wonder why we were using them, because they had more experience <laughs> than we did, or roads or towns that were named differently because that was the Russian name for it as opposed to the local name. So, yeah, it's, it's not only the mistakes that the American made or the Americans made, but there were, I'm sure... There were people there who lived through the Russian occupation as well. I'm like, here we go again. Their tolerance is going to start at zero. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 19 years old, communicating with David Petraeus. It's amazing to me sometimes how accessible certain people are because he was, what, a three-star at that time? He was a three-star at that time, yeah. You'd think they'd keep him in a glass vault somewhere. <laughs> like, don't talk to 19-year-olds, even though, of course, you were vetted by the university. So you're talking to him, and then... How the hell do you end up in Iraq? Uh, I get an email in January, or I guess it must have been February of 2007, shortly after he had arrived in Baghdad for what I, I think would have been his third stint there to become the four-star when Bush named him to head up the surge. I get an email from him saying, what are you doing this summer? 
Um, Not an email I would ever think to get from Petraeus. <laughs> um, it's in some ways, uh, in some ways, kind of makes sense for him, though. I mean, he one of his great strengths in the period when he was, I think, at his at his best, um, was just cultivating a huge range of connections with all kinds of different people, yeah. um, including Iraqis, uh, including people outside the military. Um, and I think that was, you know, that was one of the best things that he did in that in that two thousand five, six, seven, eight era um, in, in Iraq. So basically, I'm going to call that an open invite from the man. <laughs> right, right. But where does it go from there? I mean, I, I get like what a great invite, a great email to receive. What's what are the mechanics to actually get over there, though? Well, so um, the basic framework was that at this time in the war, there was this whole program that existed that the Bush administration had put in place at the beginning of the war is the embedding system. It doesn't exist anymore. It disappeared during Obama's second term. And, uh, you know, the Trump administration had no desire to bring it back, uh, nor does the current administration. Uh, but basically, there was tremendous access uh, for journalists of all types uh, to U.S. military units, mm -hmm. conventional military units for the most part, some special operations units as well. Yep. Um, but really, it was it was this system where there were pretty there were pretty low overhead costs for uh, anybody from a national news publication to a freelancer to a small town publica publication whose you know local community has had a National Guard unit mobilized. Uh, to get over there and plug in with these units that you're interested in for various reasons, uh, whether it's because it's your community's unit or because it's, you know, the big battle of the year, Talaf or Ramadi, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and you really could just, um, it was extremely, it was extremely widespread. I mean, you, you'd, you'd, you'd bounce around through these battalions and almost none of them would you be the first reporter they dealt with unless they were pretty early in their tour. Uh, so that was, I mean, basically you'd, um, you, you'd fly into Kuwait um, or, or into Baghdad, depending on kind of the, the route you were doing. Uh, and, commercial flight, I'm assuming? Um, yeah, into, uh, into Kuwait, I get yeah, commercial flight. And then at some point, you would kind of enter the military ecosystem, whether that was in Baghdad or in Kuwait. Uh, you'd, you know, you'd cross into the wire um, and, and start looking at it from the way the military was looking at it, um, looking from inside the fobs and inside the cops and inside the convoys yeah. and travel around within their aegis. So... I don't want to derail this, but I'm curious as to what was the reasonings for shutting down the embed program in the Obama administration? That's a good question. I, I have my opinions about it. I don't have I don't think there's sort of there's never been a real reported history of kind of the embedding program and what happened to it. Was there a catastrophic <clears throat> accident or they just decided to? No, end it? It, it it sort of it died slowly. Um, and it's not it's not like it ever truly died. I mean, there still is access that is provided under certain circumstances in a much more limited fashion uh, to, to journalists, to American troops on the battlefield. Um, but what it coincided with was the first Afghanistan drawdown um, when the Obama administration was transitioning everything from, you know, U.S. led big combat operations to we're advising the ANA, we're putting the ANA out front. Were so, we, though? Well, <laughs> but were we? <laughs> I mean, uh, great question. <laughs> but that was that was sort of the I, I mean, I think the administration's impetus was we want people looking at the ANA. Yeah, we don't want we don't Afghan want national army, at, everybody. Right, we don't want people looking at our guys anymore. Yeah. Uh, who've been fighting this war before? Because now we have this new policy. We're making this Afghan-led, Afghan face. So we'd rather see reporters covering that. So you started to see more kind of restrictions of, oh, well, actually, we don't want you to go to that battalion. We've got something we want you to see in Ghazni. Um, and it That's just worrisome stopped to being me. useful. I mean, it was incredibly frustrating, and it was um, it was very stifling of the the American public's and the media's ability to cover what was actually going on in Afghanistan. What level, in your opinion, as a journalist, what level of access and transparency is due to the American people? That's a great question. I mean, there has to be a line somewhere, right? Um, there's, um, I can understand why we, we don't want, uh, you know, embedded reporters running around with special mission units, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the other hand, uh, a lot of the arguments that you, you'll hear now from the Defense Department about how, why, we, why we can't do this anymore um, are... You know, they'll say, oh, well, we can't have we can't have people with Green Berets. Be, well, I spent time with Green Berets when I was 21 in Wardak. It was fine. Um, so I think do they say why or are they just they slowly start carving out the communities they don't feel comfortable with, you know, with reporters having access to? It's sort of um, in the same way that you see in the book and in the war in Afghanistan, you see this um, as units and people rotate through. Everybody is just used to what's there when they arrive yep. in their position. And there's a current generation of public affairs officers who have no no experience with embedding, oh, for sure. have, never seen, have never seen that work. And it's kind of almost incomprehensible to them that it could work, yeah. that you could just have reporters out wandering around with troops um, talking to them without, you know, a minder looking over their shoulders. 
personally, I think that the American public is due a very, very high level of transparency. And I think that I think that they they should be shown the ugly, you know, as well as the as as the beautiful, whatever you know, the opposite of the ugly would be pretty or the successful. But how else can we really as a society take a, a temperature of the impact and effect that we are having unless we show both sides of those. It really, it worries me when people say, I need you to look over here because what's, you know, we can't show you what's going on over here, but let's just look over here. I'm like, well, is there any way that we could talk about what's going on over here? We don't need to release current operations or, you know I mean? There's ways, even when it comes to SMUs, there are ways, there are ways that transparency could be achieved. And I think they should be. I think we'd I think we'd be better for it as a nation. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I give the military huge credit for the way that it did handle embedding in its heyday. I think it gave the American public um, a, a look, uh, a real time look uh, at the war that kind of we haven't seen in other conflicts or other stages of this conflict other than Vietnam when reporters really in a less formalized way were embedding constantly with very few restrictions on them. I feel like they just showed up. Yeah, that was much more the case. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, hey, um, guys, do you mind if I go into the jungle right. with you? And they're like, fuck it, you're probably going to die. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It's probably better that we have a structured system. <laughs> so when you entered into, as you described it, the military ecosystem, did you have a lot of latitude to kind of go where you wanted? To? I mean, obviously, you're not, you're not there to interrupt military operations, but could you hop around uh, from different units? And then when you did attach to a unit... I mean, I guess I'm kind of the mechanics of it is is uh, fascinating to me. I never had any real interaction with uh, any type of media in bed at all. Right. Um, so I'm just I'm fascinated. Like, who were you responsible to take care of yourself? Did you have a guy who was like, hey, man, you have to follow me at all times? <laughs> <laughs> the only time I ever had a guy where it was like, he's my escort, he's my minder, um, was uh, an embed I did with Green Berets in 2009. Uh, and they, the the Green Berets I was visiting actually were very understanding and, and separated me from this minder because they could see that he was frustrating and inhibiting sort of my ability to see what was going on. Um, but so, yeah, back in the heyday of kind of embedding with infantry and cavalry units around the battlefield, basically you'd you know, you'd kind of work your way down the chain of command. You'd show up at the big headquarters, right, like MNFI in Baghdad or ISAF in Kabul. Um, you'd deal with the public affairs staff there. You'd tell them where you wanted to go. Um, if you didn't know where you wanted to go, which there are plenty of reporters who didn't, um, you know, they would they would pick things for you. But if you did know what you wanted, if you said, okay, I want to do three weeks with 40 Commando in Sangin, and then I want to do two weeks with 3187 Infantry in Paktia, and then I want to do two weeks with 1502 Infantry in Zari, um, they would make it happen unless there were sort of some some real logistical reason why it couldn't happen. Um, it was, uh, they, they'd help you, you know, get the, get, get the flights. Um, they'd help you get onto the flights, you know, walk you to the PAX terminal or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, from there, you just, you'd fly by C-130 or helicopter to wherever it was you were going. You'd check in with, um, you know, the brigades, the army brigades would have a public affairs officer, uh, you know, an officer and a few NCOs kind of doing public affairs for them, putting out products for the families and stuff like that. And they would also, they would be kind of your point of contact when you showed up uh, with this brigade level unit. Uh, you, you might do kind of an in brief with the brigade commander and his intel officer and operations officer and sergeant major and so on. Uh, and then I would try to just, I, I would usually, in any given brigade, I would go to a battalion. And then within that battalion, I would bounce around for a couple weeks um, from company to company, try to visit a few different outposts, spend a few days of time at, at different ones, um, just to kind of get a flavor of what was going on in. Uh, you know, what, what looks like one war, but is really many, many yeah. small wars with very different flavors and tactics and terrain and so on. I was going to say, it's like saying Iraq is all the desert. Right, negative, exactly. And Afghanistan is all mountains. Because if you say that, you've never been down to Kandahar or right. the forces of Afghanistan are like, holy shit, I'm in South Dakota. It's I've never seen anything so flat in my entire life. Yeah. Yeah. And in some ways, the you know, what what I saw in Iraq in those early years um, was a, a more, more of a uniform experience. I mean, kind of the differences between what U.S. troops were experiencing in Mosul versus Ramadi versus Baghdad. I mean, they, they differed, right? They're dealing with Sunni insurgents in one area, the Mahdi army in another area, you know, more intense violence in this area, less intense violence in that area. There was rural and urban divide, but it was a lot more kind of the, the same the same stuff um, yeah. happening from AO to AO, area of operations to area of operations. Operations. Uh, whereas, yeah, when I started going to Afghanistan in 2009, you realize right away that what you see in Helmand is going to be just wildly different from what you see in Kunar. 
Yeah, it's oh, don't even get me started on Kunar. <laughs> God damn, I've gone some gone on some hikes there, <laughs> and they sucked. <laughs> it's the only time I've ever actually hit an objective wearing assless chaps. <laughs> and I wasn't actually. I mean, I, actually, I should just say chaps because I believe all chaps are assless. I think that's right. I think that is correct. Yeah. Let's just say <laughs> we went really far up, and then on the way down, I spent most of the time sliding. <laughs> and my pants did not make the journey all the way to Target. <laughs> Fortunately, I wasn't alone. It was, man, we could have been shooting a different kind of movie that day if, uh, you know, the angles and the lighting yeah. was correct. <laughs> Do you remember what year that was? Oh, God. Uh, it would have been pretty early on, right? Five? Yeah, five, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, again, I, I really... I was thinking about my experience in Afghanistan, and again, I couldn't be I couldn't be more serious when I say that I'm dated. Mm -hmm. I went to Afghanistan late 2002, back and forth all the way to mid 2000, yeah, 2005. Um, I honestly, half the time, don't even know where the helicopters were landing. Sure, yeah. because it would be an objective, or we would get briefed on where we were going. I know I've spent time up in Kaust. Uh, my last deployment in 2010 was at uh, Team 3, so a conventional SEAL team. We were in uh, Nabahar the whole time in uh, right. Zabul. Um, did not travel around at all because we were driving side by sides. But other than that, you know, we'd base out of Bagram and we'd be getting on helicopters. I stopped paying attention to what province we were right. in. I remember Kunar because they couldn't land the goddamn 47s. <laughs> right. And we ended up jumping out of the back <laughs> on this particular night. And I remember it was a far enough fall. I'm looking at it through the night vision goggles, looking at it. I'm like, this is okay. And I jump, and I had time to start rolling up the windows. And in your head, when you start doing that, you should be thinking, oh, no. Because it's <laughs> boom. And I was like halfway. I mean, people were just piling on top of me. Walked all night long up, came down. Absolute shit show. And, and we were supposed to head home like 48 hours mm -hmm. later. It was supposed to be a turnover. Uh, of course, the people that we were after heard us the instant that the helicopter made it near the valley. So they were gone anyway. We hiked all night long for nothing, destroyed an excellent pair of pants that had served me well <laughs> up until that point. I think I just spiked every piece of clothing that I was wearing into the garbage can, took a shower, and we left. Right. But it, it's I don't know how to describe the the difficulty of that terrain. Yeah, and there's I mean, not very many ways around it. I mean, this is one of the th one of the first things U.S. troops from you know from JSOC saw when they arrived in Kunar in the spring of 2002. I mean, I uh, opened one of the early chapters of the book by talking about Tom Greer, um, you know, uh, now deceased, but he was the the Delta Force officer yeah. who who also was known as Dalton Fury and wrote uh, this book about the Battle of Tora Bora. Um, but First off, Dalton Fury, amazing name. <laughs> like if there's names to either give yourself or be given. <laughs> I'm curious who, who thought of that one. I didn't. I never asked him that. Um, whether that was... Secretly, he might. If I wanted that name, <laughs> secretly, I would think of it and then pay somebody else to give it to me. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but he describes, um, you know, the, the first um, the first American military unit to come up into Kunar in the spring of 2002, about six months after 9-11, um, was some SEALs from your old organization yep. and some other guys tagging along with them. Yep. Um, just a real little team. Um, basically, these little these little AFO, Advanced Force Operations Units, were spreading out over the east, um, trying to figure out where the Arabs had gone after Tora Bora, because where there were other Arabs, there might be Bin Laden or there might be somebody who could tell you something about Bin Laden. Yeah. Uh, and one of these teams shows up in Kunar, um, Greer goes up and visits them shortly afterward because he was responsible for you know a sector of these AFO teams, um, and he he described remembering you know getting to Asadabad, looking up at the hills around it, which are kind of nothing compared to the ones that you see uh, you know a little higher up. Uh, yeah. And thinking this is going to be a terrible place for helicopters. And I mean, maybe the only way to describe it so people listening to this could could imagine it is it's the Himalayas. Yeah. I mean, it's not Everest, but Everest is in the same range. Right. That's the type of stuff that we're talking about. It's incredibly jagged mountains. And what you see up there that you don't see in a lot of parts of Afghanistan is the forest. Uh, yeah. which presents this whole other layer of challenges to U.S. helicopters, U.S. drones, uh, U.S. everything. Yeah. Um, you know, because you down in the valley floors, you know, you've got these lush green ribbons of, uh, of uh, sort of cultivated territory in these little narrow valley floors. And from down there, the mountains look pretty brown, right? There's kind of, there's this lower scrub forest to these evergreen oaks. Um, and then above that, it just looks kind of brown. But what you can't see is that uh, from down there is that if, if you keep hiking up into those mountains, you're going to hit this conifer forest. Forest with these huge pines and firs and cedars, just enormous trees um, that 
uh, sometimes, you know, guys wouldn't even wouldn't be aware that that stuff was there until the first time they did an air assault mission from their outpost and the Chinook stumped them up in this forest. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the range of things that guys would compare it to, some guys would say, oh, it looked like the Pacific Northwest. I was just going to say um, that PNW. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's um, well, one, one of your uh, uh, former, um, not squadron mates, I guess, but uh, Jimmy Hatch. Um, yeah, I know Jimmy well. Um, he, he described it as looking like his native Utah. Um, and then, you know, other guys would say it looked like Endor from Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Yeah. I get, you know, briefly, I spent time up there. We would try to, you know, get in and out in the cycle of darkness, which right. is not easy. Right. Before we get in Afghanistan, though, we got to go backwards to Iraq. <laughs> You're 19. You show up in Iraq. What? How long did you spend for your first time there? The first trip was not much more than a month. Okay. Um, Kick that microphone in front of your face. Just look, just push. The, there you go. Just push the whole thing towards me. Bam. For you. There you go. Okay. There we Perfect. go. Perfect. Better? Yep. So just about a month. Yeah. It was maybe maybe five weeks in, in and around, all in and around Baghdad, that, that first trip. Would they allow you to go out on combat operations with them? Yeah. I mean, it was, again, they, they just, um, as far as they were concerned, they a reporter had showed up. They'd had other reporters show up before. This was the drill. Um, so, you know, the, I think the first unit that I visited was uh, in the, the rural belt south of Baghdad. Um, then spent like a week or two with uh, a striker unit that yep. was in downtown Baghdad on Haifa Street. Um, then uh, an infantry battalion that was in the southwestern part of Baghdad dealing with the EFP problem, these uh, I- Iranian explosively yep. formed projectiles. Um, and then there was one more. Yeah. And then uh, another striker battalion that was in the, the rural northern belt just north of the city. And so, yeah, what I would do is I just would, um, you know, you'd show up at one of these outposts that's occupied by, you know, a company of 150 infantrymen or maybe by just a platoon of 40 infantrymen. Uh, and you would just kind of get to know their daily routine and go with them, go with them where they went. Um, you know, the platoon would go out on a patrol. You'd tag along with them uh, and you'd kind of figure out, well, OK, do I do I stick by the. Uh, you know, where do I sort of st- sit in the formation? You kind of figure out, talk, talk to these guys before you go outside the wire about kind of what you're going to be doing and ask them, you know, so that they can express their preferences about what they want you to do when you take contact or something yep. like that. So usually what I would wind up doing is um, I would find a, you know, a squad leader, kind of a mid-level NCO who, who seemed to know what he was doing, uh, often one who didn't seem to want me around because I feel like they usually knew their business, um, and, and just stick to them like glue. Uh, and that would be a good kind of vantage point to see everything that was going on, because uh, there, you know, he's going to be talking with the platoon leader. He's going to be talking with the platoon sergeant. He's also, you know, moving his guys around, and I can go see them and take pictures of them and and, and talk to them and everything. Do you find that most people were willing to be pretty open with you? Yeah, I mean, I felt like back in that era, um, any new outpost that I showed up at, it kind of felt like there was maybe a. 10 or 20% of people who really were just like, oh man, a reporter's here, I want to talk, I want to, I want to talk all about what's going on. Another 10 or 20% who were just like, I'm not talking to that guy, I don't want anything to do with the media, whether it's because of just you know general perception of the media or a, a bad experience they've had with the, with the media. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then everyone else kind of in the middle, kind of the majority of people are just like, well, this guy's here. Um, you have, you know, back in that era, you would have all kinds of attachments would be coming through visiting these units, whether it's, uh, you know, some intelligence contractor or an asymmetric warfare group contractor or um, it just, there, there would be these sort of individual people who would show up and tag along with with these units patrols. Um, and, you know, I, I sort of found that over time, generally, people became more receptive rather than less. Um, yep. And it could happen pretty quickly. You know, it could just be. You know, a couple days um, in some intense place, and and people who didn't want to talk to you the first day are pretty happy talking to you the third day. Did you ever get to experience uh, frontline combat? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I, over over the years, I think I probably embedded with about twenty different infantry battalions and cavalry squadrons in many different parts of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I, I never was in kind of like house clearing combat, yeah, right? I which mean, is a good thing. Probably not the best place for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with that. Fall a little bit farther back in the train, as we say. <laughs> you would, um, in, in the surge era in 2007, 2008, you would go on night raids, which you know regular infantry units did back at that time, uh, much more than they would in later years in Afghanistan. Um, you know, a, a battalion might have kind of a designated platoon that does night raids. Yep. Um, so I'd tag along on those. Um, more often than not, they were quiet. Um, uh, you know, I saw places in southern Afghanistan. Some of the scariest places I've ever been were places in southern Afghanistan um, where it was just just these dismounted IED fields. You just felt like you're walking through minefields, sanguine with the Brits, um, you know, Zari in the Argandav Valley with the 101st. 
um, places where casualties just happened routinely. I mean, they just yeah. they just lost guys a lot. Um, so those those were kind of the the scariest places I would say. And then places like the Petch were kind of more exciting. You know, there's just there's constant gun battles and artillery barrages and everything, uh, but there's not quite that same level of just dread um, that you get when it's just walking out of the minefield every day. Well, at least, I mean, for me, if I had to choose between a gunfight or walking around where I thought there were IEDs, I'm going the gunfight every <laughs> single time. Yeah. Because at least you feel like you have some level of control. Uh, whether or not you do is probably arguable because it depends on the aim and another human being. But yeah, IEDs, I think, scare me more than anything else. Absolutely. And I think for conventional forces that fought in Iraq and Afghanistan and that got really used to this routine of, OK, we have our sector, we drive and walk around in it waiting to get blown up, showing the flag, um, Kunar could present this really exciting alternative view of what the war could be like. And for a lot of units and guys, it kind of felt right. I mean, a bunch of different guys described it to me as the Kunar syndrome, yeah. where you get up there and you're really fighting the enemy. You're not just sort of waiting to be killed by the enemy. Um, and it could be really satisfying and even addictive, uh, you know, and, and get, get guys to um, find ways into the next unit going back to Kunar, stuff like that, which, you know, I, I wouldn't hear about so much with uh, Sangin or the Argandab. I mean, certainly there are people who wound up going back to those places over and over again, yeah. um, but not so much seeking it. You got to be careful with that, too, because there are ways or I should well, maybe ways isn't the best way to say it. If you take it too far, you'll end up physically leaving that valley, but never mentally. And yeah, absolutely. It'll destroy you for the rest of your life. I mean, I certainly know people like that. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I encountered a fair number of people like that in you know interviewing several hundred American veterans the patch for this book. There are a lot of guys who, yeah, in some ways, just have this really deep nostalgia for this horrible time in their lives. It's because they never left. Yeah. I would imagine a lot of them equate sights, sounds, experiences, feelings. They'll use what happened when they were in the valley. That's their reference to go back to. Yeah. There's a part I've, uh, you know, and maybe it happens to everybody to some degree. Some I think a lot more than others, and and I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because the person that you are before you go in, or the experiences that you have when you're. The, I don't. You know what I mean? There's who fucking knows? There's right. so many variables, but some people, it becomes the flag in their life. And I would imagine for a lot of the people you were talking to in the conventional army, we're talking early twenties at best. Right. That flag in your like. They'd go back if you'd yeah. let them go back, and it would be to the detriment of who they are as a person, physically, mentally, emotionally, all of those things. I don't know how to decouple them from that. Uh, I know a couple people who have, they drive their car looking in the rearview mirror as opposed to out the windshield. Right. They get in accidents a lot. Yeah, right. It's, it's a tough one. You also see it, I mean, another another a flip side of that phenomenon is guys who keep chasing it, you know? Um, they've had this unbelievable experience sometime in their 20s as a you know, team leader or platoon leader in the Petch Valley or the Korangal, somewhere like that. And then, you know, their next deployment is somewhere like the Argandab, and it's just dull and full of dread and horrible. Uh, and they wind up finding ways to sort of, you know, whether it's going to the Ranger Regiment, going to Special Forces, yeah. um, going to some other more specialized unit, um, finding finding ways to sort of try and keep chasing the dragon of trying to get that experience again, which you kind of never really can. Yeah, I think it's tough. Uh, and I hope that those people are able to at some point in their life shift their gaze elsewhere yeah because the military will chew you up and spit you out and i don't yep. think necessarily maliciously it's the military has a mission they have a mission statement they go and they execute that mission and at some point you'll either time out your body will quit and they will move on without you yeah i mean i remember talking to one officer army officer army infantry officer who had been a lieutenant in the Korangal for a very eventful period in 2006, 2007, uh, and him telling me that he had essentially had nightmares for years about the Korangal every night when he slept, except during his 90-day Ranger rotations forward. Really? Um, and that was kind of like the, the reprieve um, wow. for a period of time. That's horrible. When you were embedded and the units you were with would take contact, what did they expect you to do? Or what would you do as a reporter? Um, because I'm not a professional photographer, um, I didn't have to kind of, you know, I could make myself small. I just take cover. I just try not to get hurt or get anybody else hurt. Try not I mean, to get hit was, by pointy things. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> that was the job was, you know, number, you know, don't, don't get hurt and don't get anybody else hurt. Yeah. Um, so just, you know, don't go running off somewhere. Don't do anything stupid. 
Um, stick by that that squad leader or whoever it is that you have sort of decided you're going to stick with. Um, and if they tell you to do something, do it. Um, more often than not, they won't. They're just busy. And if you are just kind of being an unobtrusive presence, then nobody even really notices your, your presence that much. I mean, yeah. that's sort of the goal. Yeah, stay in their hip pocket a little bit. Did you notice, I'm curious, because I'm sure you, as you said, there were times where you were involved in uh, taking contact and then there was those groups of people, you know, this 10% that, hey, this is who I am, I want to talk to you, 10%, like, why don't you beat it, and everybody else in between. Did you find that there were times that you could talk with them where they would be more open? I'm thinking, because I'm thinking about the mental escalation and de-escalation and the hormonal escalation and de-escalation of being in a firefight. I'm just curious if you found that they'd be more receptive and open to talking in certain uh, situations or instances. It's a good question. I'm trying to think back on examples. I'm thinking of an incident in Mosul in 2008, um, which was the first time that I was, you know, with American troops when they they took casualties and lost guys killed. Um, and I remember talking. You know, I, I wasn't in in the as the event was happening uh, and casualties were being evacuated and everything. I wasn't trying to talk to people during that, right? Probably not a good time. <laughs> but yeah. afterward, you know, and, and during that circumstance, again, as someone who I'm not a professional photographer, I don't need to be kind of snapping pictures the whole time. I can do whatever is somebody needs me to do. I can, you know, put a tourniquet on somebody's leg if that's needed. I can, you know, help carry one one leg of a stretcher. You know, those were things that I that I did at various points in, in Iraq and Afghanistan um, just to try to, you know, make yourself useful in some small way, given yeah. that you're there. Um, but then, yeah, afterward... Um, Sometimes after a really traumatic event, I would find that uh, people were kind of were much more open to talking to you. That than, doesn't surprise than me, actually. Yeah, and which was likely very cathartic for them. In some cases, yeah, I think so. And also, in some cases, I think it was. You know, I'm thinking now about sort of the the commanders, the company commanders and battalion commanders. I think in many cases, particularly in Afghanistan, uh, it could be. Um, it was just like nice to have somebody who, who you weren't in charge of to talk to. Um, for a few days at one of these outposts, yeah. you know, I mean, in in Baghdad, if you're a battalion commander, you probably were living on a big base with half a dozen other battalion commanders. You have peers that you can go and see and talk to. If you're that battalion commander at Fob Blessing or the company commander at Cop Michigan in the Patch, that's a pretty lonely kind of. It's a lonely job, yeah. um, and it, it can be sort of. It can be nice, I think, to just sort of have somebody else come into the office um, who. You know, it's maybe you don't drop the facade or the mask of command, but it's just different than than being your your subordinates or your superiors. There's a there's a fine line. Uh, there was another famous general who maybe crossed that line with his uh, <laughs> laissez faire attitude with reporters. We can leave him unnamed if you want to. Got in a little bit of trouble. Appeared in the pages of Rolling Stone. <laughs> That would probably be the far example of maybe got a little bit too comfortable because you do have to remember at the end of the day, right? You're a military officer in an official capacity, and sure, there is some modicum of uh, professionalism that should be maintained. And I'm not right. intimately familiar with what happened in yeah. uh, that previous situation. People can go research it on their own. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I give talks to um, you know to military units, whether it's a green green beret company that's getting ready to deploy or an ROTC detachment or something that are just kind of military in the media talks, like. You know what to expect, and you know, for the, one of the things I tell them now is, well, you're not going to deal with the media. I mean, the, the age of embedding is over. But uh, speaking from kind of a place of if you were dealing with them, it's just important to be kind of literate about who you're dealing with. Um, understand the kind of reporter you're dealing with. Understand kind of where they've been and what they've done. Whether they're a TV reporter or a print reporter or a photographer it makes a huge difference. Or um, a 19 year old kid on their or, first or trip. a 19 year old kid on their first trip. Um, yeah. So you know, props to everybody who was willing to. Uh, uh, to you know, take a chance and talk, talk to me then. But it's amazing how fast you kind of, um, in this perennially young organization, the infantry, I mean, by the time I was like 25 in Afghanistan in 2013, um, I, to some, you know, to, to 18 and 19 year old guys on their first deployments, you were it's the like, season, oh, that's dude. the war reporter, you know, he's been around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you were, like the very first trip that you did, are you using uh, like cassette or digital recorder? Are you taking notes? I mean, how are you encapsulating or documenting the things that you're seeing? Yeah, I, I learned over time kind of how to how best to do it. Um, uh, eventually, what I would do is I would I, I, I carried a digital recorder everywhere. Initially, would just use that for interviews, but eventually, kind of learned to just put that on at the beginning of the patrol. 
Um, and then, you know, if it was in patrol where nothing happened, yeah, you delete, delete the recording. Um, but if it was a patrol where something did happen, that's a really useful record that can tell you exactly how long it lasted when your your mind is not, yeah. can't can't tell you how long it lasted. It may have felt much longer or shorter than it really was. Yep. Um, and also just take pictures constantly. Because again, not a photographer, but uh, that's a really helpful just visual record to have as you then sit and write about it later. What um, kind of camera were you using? I used, um, on, on my early trips, I used a, what was it called? I think it was a, a Canon S90. It was a little little sort of point-and-shoot digital mini SLR thing. Okay. Um, and it took beautiful photos. I um, my, my favorite photos that I ever took were on that little thing rather than any larger SLRs that I carried on some later trips. Wow. So how was it coming back? Night, I'm assuming you're still 19 when you came back from your first <laughs> Iraq trip. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was funny. is because I would be, um, I would be, you know, I... In some cases, jumping right back from, you know, the surge in Baghdad into classes. Um, How was that for you? It was strange, um, but I also hadn't been there for that long, right? It's not like I had just spent 15 months, you know, in the shit. Um, yeah. I, all, these trips were always kind of, I was always on the move. I was always bouncing around, spending a few days kind of in some nice air-conditioned place and then a few days out in some horrible little outpost. Yeah, but see, some people describe that as just going on vacation with their family. <laughs> they would use the same terminology. Yeah, we stayed in some place with some AC, the hotel, <laughs> and then we went to some shitty place where they stayed in a tent. So yeah, you you were moving around, but you have to take into context where you were moving around. Right. At the age that you were moving around. I'm saying in comparison to your peers, I think the experience was probably slightly different. It's a different different type of study abroad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did your classmates ask you questions about what you saw? Yeah, for sure. I mean, people were always really interested. Um, uh, I think there uh, there could be kind of a, a detachment from anything about the wars on, you know, a isolated college campus in, in New Jersey. Um, but any little touch point that made them more real, um, people were curious about. I mean, maybe not everybody, but um, I, I definitely didn't find that people, you know, didn't want to hear about it. Yeah. Did you find the transitions home to be relatively easy for you? I did. Yeah. I mean, I was, yeah, I never, never had any real problems. I'm sure your parents came back from the first one. They're like, cool, hope you got it out of your system. Yeah, exactly, right. Like, yeah, mom and dad, about that. <laughs> right. Can I, I'm going to take a year off from college. I'll be, I'll be heading to Mosul. Yeah. So <laughs> you, did, you did that first month, came back. How long before you went back a second time? Well, I went back to school for my sophomore year, and then I had met, um, you know, I had met, met a bunch of real war reporters um, over in Baghdad during that first trip. I had met. Um, I like how you said real, <laughs> as if you weren't over there doing exactly the same thing. But I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say some of them didn't either. <laughs> Perhaps. But some of them really did. But some of them really did. Um, and, you know, t two guys that I met on my first trip were um, Evan Wright from Rolling Stone, who wrote the book Generation Kill about mm -hmm. 1st Recon Battalion in Iraq. Um, and he became a, a friend and a mentor. And then Michael Gordon, who at the time was this uh, crotchety old New York Times correspondent, now crotchety old Wall Street Journal correspondent, um, who just despite his sort of grumpy old exterior would just he would just go bounce around to absolutely the roughest places you could imagine um and, and plug in with these units and 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 embed with them for however long it took to kind of understand what was going on um and he can he sort of gave me the opportunity he was he was beginning to write what at the time was his third iraq book he and a retired uh, marine general named mick trainer had written a book about desert storm um back in the early 90s mm -hmm. they had then written a big best-selling book about the invasion the build-up and invasion of iraq called cobra 2 um and then uh they were getting to work on a third book that was going to be initially was kind of going to be about the surge but it, it grew into being a whole this massive tome about sort of the post-2003 u.s occupation of iraq um and uh you know, Michael basically, Michael and I reached an arrangement where I, I was going to go and do these embeds um, freelancing, but that I would also be doing research for him at the same time. And in return, I mean, he was paying me and he would um, he would sort of grease the wheels for me to be able to in between embeds, go and get some downtime at the New York Times Bureau in Baghdad and crash there for a week and, you know, go through my notes and write stuff up. Um, which was, you know, a, a good kind of break, especially I was doing started to do longer trips at this point. Like, uh, I think it was about three months in the fall of 2008. Um, when you did your second one? The second one. Yeah. So when you are reporting, I should ask this about your first uh, your first month over there, too. Do you write when you get home or are you publishing things while you are overseas? I was publishing things as they happened, kind of maybe not immediately afterward, but within a couple weeks after they happened. Um, depending on what I was, you know, whether it was 
a story about a particular event or whether it was more of a, well, this is what's going on in Ramadi um, at this point in time. Um, but yeah, I would, I would do it as I was, as, as I was over there. And who do you, where do you publish that to? Well, again, so I was, you know, I was a freelancer. So the, the way it worked, um, back then was, uh, the military would take you as an embed, um, provided you had sort of a, a letter of accreditation from some publication saying that they were going to take your stuff. Um, you didn't have to be a staff reporter uh, for that publication. They just had to know that you had an arrangement with them. Um, so I would, for different trips, I would uh, do it for different publications. Uh, at one point, I was writing stuff for the the Long War Journal. Um, uh, f- at another point, I eventually, was the, the New York Times had this site that has since been revived and then since disappeared again called At War, which was kind of a, an online... Uh, additional war coverage site that was really? a, I've never heard of that. It was great. It was um, a good venue um, both for freelancers and it was a good venue uh, over the years for a lot of veterans, uh, you know, getting out of the military to write about their service. Um, uh, but so that that was one of the first well, sort of big places that I wrote for was, uh, you know, while I was doing these trips reporting for Michael Gordon for his book, um, I would stay at the, the New York Times Baghdad Bureau. And I guess actually yeah, before it was called At War, this this vertical this site within the New York Times was called Baghdad Bureau because it was everything was so Iraq focused in yeah. 2007 2008 it wasn't until 2009 that people started paying attention to Afghanistan again um, unless you were deploying to Afghanistan <laughs> absolutely or or lived there for that matter <laughs> correct yeah. Yeah. yeah also good point touche <laughs> yeah uh did you notice any major differences between your 2007 and your 2008 time over there yeah huge differences i mean this was um to kind of kind of explain the timeline here i mean 2005 2006 uh was when iraq had burst apart at the seams just descended into absolute chaos and civil war um which you saw um 2007 was the year of a, a variety of events that changed what iraq looked like one of them was the surge uh, where U.S. forces, you know, doubled down, brought in 30,000 extra troops um, to try and secure this greater Baghdad area and pull it back from the brink. Um, 2007 was also the year that uh, the the awakening took off, that all these little Sunni groups all around central Iraq um, kind of uh, either flipped sides or depending on, you know, the, the flavor of the particular town or district, they might have been insurgent groups that had been fighting Americans and now they were taking American pay and digging up the IEDs that they had you know, previously put in. Uh, or they might be groups that had been fighting against the Sunni insurgents all along. Um, but there was this, you know, there was this popular um, uh, resistance against the Al Qaeda in Iraq, the forerunners of ISIS, that changed the flavor of what was going on in Iraq. And so by 2008, I mean, it was it was a lot quieter. There was a really precipitous drop off in violence uh, in, in Sunni areas of Iraq in 2008 uh, and then and then in Shia areas as well. After this massive spring uh, spring rebellion that happened with the Mahdi army in the spring of 2008. So by the fall of 2008, it, Iraq was pretty quiet, uh, with the exception of Mosul, um, which was remained a very violent place. Yeah. For quite some time. Yeah. I can't imagine going over there just to sit back not to sit back that's it not a good way to describe it just be there and be involved but just to report and not be able to have a finger on the pulse of the outcome it's it's uh, i take my hat off to you for that man for for being willing to go over there and i'm glad that people like you exist that are willing to do that like i said i do believe that the american people are due a level of of transparency and the details again can be figured out by people smarter than me but i think i think it's important I think one of the worst things that we can do is hide the actual cost of what war does, not only to the nation that you are invading, but to the people who are there, you know, wearing the flag on their uniform. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, I I certainly think that more transparency and more reporting is better. Um, I should also, I mean, I should be clear that I think embedding is only a part of that. I mean, embedding was an incredibly useful vehicle for me, kind of starting out in my journalism career. And it also was fantastic uh, in that it, it, provided an avenue for a lot of smaller outlets that wouldn't have been able to cover the war otherwise mm-hmm. to cover it. You know, uh, if if Idaho's 116th Brigade goes and gets mobilized from the National Guard and goes to Iraq, now the Idaho statesman or whatever the paper may be can send a reporter to go cover them. Um, but it is, it's a small slice of the war that you're seeing. You're seeing it from uh, this one narrow American perspective. So yep. for organizations that, are, that, that have the resources uh, to really cover the war, um, embedding needs to be one part of the uh, of of what they're doing. Um, they need to have people covering the politics of it, people out covering the lives of Iraqi and Afghan civilians. Um, ideally, people in some way covering the insurgency. 
um, covering the lives of local security forces. Uh, because in any of these conflicts, even at our peak involvement, when there was something like almost 170,000 U.S. troops in Iraq in 2007, we're one actor in really complex wars. Oh, yeah. How would you cover it from the insurgent side? Do you know any reporters that have been able to embed? On yeah, that absolutely, side? absolutely, I do. Um, I mean, I one guy who appears in the book. Um, there's a guy named Paul Refstall, who's a Norwegian journalist, um, video journalist, who he had, like a lot of Western reporters, had spent time with the Mujahideen in the 1980s, um, and like a smaller number of Western reporters, he kind of revived those ties. Um, during the post-2001 era. And he had cool. some, some, I mean, really on-the-edge experiences. Does he have trouble walking that. due to his massive balls? <laughs> he probably does. I mean, does he just carry a wheelbarrow <laughs> with him everywhere? I mean, there's obviously... I mean, I would almost be... Well, my experience with the enemy that we were fighting, one of the biggest things that you would worry about, or not worry about, but have in the back of your mind is capture's not an option knowing what right. would likely happen if that were to occur. Maybe the consequences would be different for a journalist, even though, I, what was the journalist who got his head sawed off at the beginning? I mean, beginning? it depends where you are and who captures you, That's right? what I'm saying. I um, mean, there's some consequences to aligning yourself with the wrong people. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's what Paul, um, I, I describe, you know, Paul talking about in one of the chapters of this book is that he, uh, in 2009, he went back and, um, and he he essentially embedded with uh, a, a local Salafi insurgent commander in the patch, lo, you know, wealthy local guy um, named Mullah Dauran, who he had known in the 80s during the jihad against the Soviets. Um, and he um, he did two visits, I think, to Dauran. Um, the first one went great from his perspective. Um, uh, you know, Dauran was a very accommodating host. Um, I think the the scariest moments were there actually was I was able to reconstruct based on the timeline of Paul's visit. And the timeline of like WikiLeaks reports, um, there was a Red Squadron raid um, that uh, he actually he kind of that was on Dauron's group uh, that Paul was not at the target site, obviously, um, but at kind of the the next area over. And he, yeah. he, he describes kind of in the night, he, you know, hearing the AC-130 and, um, you know, Dauron being like, hey, everybody, time to go, you know, up into the forest. Yeah. <laughs> and it turned out uh, the next day that the uh, that Red Squadron had killed Dauron's second in command. Um during this little raid. But then during a subsequent visit, uh, he went and met up with a subordinate of Dauron's um, who was less accommodating and essentially kept him captive for a period of time. Um, and the, the bizarre thing was that uh, they were in this in this area north of the Petch where there, you know, there were all these different insurgent groups operating in the area, including outsiders, Al-Qaeda guys. Um, and and uh, Paul recalls basically being told by his hosts slash captors, uh, hey, if the Al Qaeda guys come and fight us, you better be prepared to pick up a weapon because you're not going to like it if they capture you at um, all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that might be the toughest aspect to. Well, I don't know much about reporting at all, but I, I would think that that would probably be the more difficult aspect to try to capture. Mm hmm. Um, I mean, that was I, I would say, uh, you know, there were many challenges in trying to write this book. That's one of the ones that I. Uh, I think I was least successful at is capturing the enemy side. I mean, I did what I could. Um, I, I did talk to some former Taliban combatants, uh, mostly kind of local guys who had who had been up in these villages who I didn't initially know they had fought uh, fought against the Americans. I was just sort of interviewing groups of men from these villages, and eventually they might kind of volunteer and explain why they had why they had they had fought against U.S. troops. Um, but did you ever so, try to interview detainees? No, I never. I mean, so. I mean, I tried to. Yes, um, there's a. In particular, there's a. My white whale, who I uh, still would love to talk to, um, is a, a man who's alive in an Afghan prison somewhere named Abu Ikhlas Al Masri, who's an Egyptian Egyptian Al Qaeda figure who was captured in 2010 after kind of being the um, the bright flashing light that U.S. special operators and the CIA were hunting for in Kunar for you know about nine years. Um, and that's a guy who, you know, I've seen bits and pieces of his interrogation reports. Mm -hmm. uh, I've talked to people who talked to him once he was in the Bagram internment facility. Um, and I mean, that's, you know, he would be a he would be a tremendous resource, I think. Um, sure he's still alive? Supposedly. He, he was as of a couple years ago. Sure he's still in Afghanistan? <laughs> 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 I think he might have a few stamps on his passport, depending on how high up the uh, the tree that he went. When did you start shifting your lens from Iraq to Afghanistan? I first went to Afghanistan in the spring of 2009. 
Um, and it was another of these shorter trips. It was like five or six weeks. Um, and I spent part of it um, in Wardak province, south of Kabul, with uh, a Green Beret team, or a few Green Beret teams, and then part of it uh, in Helmand province, uh, which at the time was U.S. Marines were just starting to show up. It was still a British show. And um, so that 2009 trip, I spent some time with this uh, Illinois National Guard police advisor team who were, they were just out there living on the edge in, uh, you know, little tiny American element in this British sector, um, going and running around visiting Afghan police outposts and, you know, helping them get what they needed and figure out what they needed. What were your first impressions of Afghanistan when you landed there? Um, trying Actually, to think. And so what were the mechanics? How would you get over there? What yeah, was the so journey look like? Afghanistan was, um, I would I would fly commercial into Kabul through either either through Dubai or through um or, or or through Istanbul. Um, once I tried a, a different way than flying commercial, and it was unsuc- it was resulted in a, a kind of a visa and passport fiasco. That was <laughs> <laughs> try to avoid those at all costs. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, um, uh, but so yeah, you'd you'd fly into Kabul International Airport, Hamid Karzai International Airport, yeah. um, and then you would kind of you know you would have some place to stay lined up. Whether it, there were all these guest houses for for, for Westerners at the peak of uh, U.S. and NATO for press, you mean? Uh, I mean, there was so much more than press. I mean, press was some of it, but there were so many. I mean, aid workers and contractors working for working for aid organizations. Contractors shall we just call it for God knows what else? Should we just call it the military industrial complex? <laughs> it was quite the you know motley motley assortment of uh, yeah. you know, and I, I never spent much time in that sort of that Kabul expat world. I, I later I uh, later saw the trailers for that Tina Fey movie, and it looked like a lot of fun, and I kind of was sad that I that I missed it. Um, you know, because I was, I, I remember getting a glimpse of it during my first trip, um, where I had, you know, I flew into Kabul, immediately went over to whatever Camp Eggers or whatever base was that I went over to and kind of plugged into my embeds. Um, but then at one point on the way out or between embeds or something, I was coming up from Helmand and I flew via either British or US C 130 back into Kabul airport, kind of crossed the fence from the military side to the civilian side of the airport and went over to this place, the Gandamak Lodge, that was the like the little hotel guest house place that I was staying. Um, and this place was just bizarre. Um, I it was it's like it eventually was shut down because, you know, with the way they the way these places would run afoul of the Afghan government was over liquor, you know, liquor and stuff like that. Um but this place, the Gandamak Lodge, it had kind of this like dark basement where there might be like former SBS guys who wouldn't tell you what company they were working for, who were, you know, drinking. And then I remember like uh, uh, showing up and going and like showering and dropping my dirty body armor and then like coming back out. And um, there were all these people in tuxedos in the yard, like drinking gin and tonics. And it was uh, evidently it was June 18th, Waterloo Day. And this was uh, an important day for the British expat community in Kabul. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> God, what a trip. And how old were you at this point? Uh, prob- I would have been 21. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, 21, just dropping off my dirty body armor, <laughs> throwing on the old bow tie for a g and I, I did not have my tux. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel I, d- like I do think I got a, I probably got the, uh, an overpriced G&T and a terrible hamburger for sure. out of that evening. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do you ever head over to the Ariana Hotel? Yes, I, I remember the Ariana Hotel. Yeah, they yep. have great spaghetti there. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, bolognese. It's, they have amazing bolognese. I've had to know it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. There, eh, there might have been some people who got in a touch of trouble there too for <laughs> alcohol consumption. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, that was an interesting. The whole oh, Kabul, such an interesting place. Um, how long were you in Afghanistan your first time? Uh, that was uh, maybe a five or six week trip in 2009. Okay. How yeah. many times have you been total? Total to Afghanistan, um, f- four times, I think. Okay. I may be missing one. I think four times. Okay. And then how about to Iraq? Uh, two times Iraq. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a substantial amount of time. And then- I mean, I should, I mean, I should be clear though. I mean, these typically are short trips. These are yeah. not like, I'm never going and like living there for 15 months, like, a, like guys on deployment or something like that. Or like the correspondents who- uh, uh, you know, the Kabul correspondent of the New York Times or whatever organization who just, you know, lived there for a period of years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it added up over over time. When did you start developing your interest in the Petch Valley? Um, so I went in 2010, my second Afghanistan trip. It was the summer of the, of the big surge in Afghanistan when President Obama had committed. So uh, we were both there at the same time. I was there from February till August of 2010. Yeah, we would have, we both were there. We probably, I, I never made it to Zabul, um, but I spent part of that summer in Kandahar. Okay. Um, 
but it was, you know, that was the summer that things were going big, right? It was the, the war was becoming conventional. It was uh, it, when Obama took office, there was something like 33,000 U.S. troops in the country. By the end of 2010, there were pushing 100,000 U.S. troops in the country. So he tripled the size uh, of the U.S. presence. And summer of 2010 was, you know, the summer that all these all these pieces were coming into place and all these U.S. units and, and you know, allied units from ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force, the NATO coalition, uh, were just, they were on the march. They were pushing out every which way, um, building new outposts and paving new roads and trying to secure more districts and try to do the coin thing, right? They, yeah. were, they were trying to replicate in Afghanistan what they'd done in Iraq. Um, to use a phrase from your book, the ink blot. The ink blot, theory, theory. exactly. No. Where you slop some ink and it spreads, and then, you know, where you get to the edges of that, you throw down some more ink, and the goal being eventually you got it all. And that's what they were trying to do. Um, and part of what fascinated me right off the bat about the patch was, so I think I visited four infantry battalions that summer in different parts of the country. Uh, and pretty much everywhere you went, it was the commanders would tell you, you know, the battalion commander on your in brief would kind of explain how, you know, we're expanding, we're building, we've built this number of new outposts, we're going to build this number more, we've spent X amount of reconstruction money, um, just kind of throwing all the great inputs at you to demonstrate how much they were doing. Yeah. Um, and then I went to the patch, which I didn't actually know a lot about. It was, uh, so I had sort of picked all these other embeds, but some embed had fallen through for some logistical reason, um, and somebody had suggested, well, try try going to 1327 in Kunar, uh, since 2327 is busy and you can't go to them. Um, and that wound up being a you know a really good um, a really good happenstance um, because I you know I flew into flew by C one thirty into Jalalabad Airfield, horrible humid place. I'm just kind of like just like I remember being stuck at Jalalabad Airfield for like a week waiting for a helicopter to go up to the patch. Basically, feels like where you live, DC in the summertime. <laughs> worse it's, though, if, if anything could be worse, <laughs> it, it's like it's like the, it's like the rainforest exhibit at the zoo in DC. Like yeah, you know, I, but I, slightly yeah. hotter. <laughs> As a person who wears glasses, I remember like during this week, like stuck there, like go out of the tent in the middle of the night, and my glasses would immediately yeah. fog up. Um, and then you know, eventually you know, wait around at Jalalabad. Um, get a helicopter up to forward operating base blessing the battalion headquarters in the patch um it's much cooler up there you on the flight in you immediately kind of see the terrain that you've been hearing about you, you know realize this is something something very different from the war in the south and other parts of the east um what were your first thoughts first time you saw it good question um i don't know um i mean i i remember i remember just being struck by yeah, by the terrain, by how green things were, um, by animals. I remember there was like a big monitor lizard that I had to step over to get to the latrine at one point, like the first night. It's like, well, that's different. Were you shocked by the Afghans' ability to build their houses and structures in terrain that is almost that vertical oh, on yeah. shit that is 100% not permitted or OSHA approved? <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. And you see, even, even in the- It even, defies gravity sometimes. Even in the towns right around Fob Blessing, which is really the valley floor, um, the, the houses are stacked on the mountainside in this way, um, like like little Lego bricks or, um, you know, there's there's uh, one guy quoted in the book who, who uh, describes it as like an Ewok village. Um, but yeah, they just—they're on these stilts, just perched up on these mountainsides. They everything, every house looks like it should be sliding off the moment it rains or something like that. Um, but yeah, noticing that, and then before I even you know kind of left the wire and went and visited one of the smaller outposts, um, I remember going in for kind of the you know the typical in brief with the with the battalion commander who you know uh, I didn't know him, I'd never exchanged emails with him or anything else like that, um, and there was just such a different tone with this guy um, than with you know all the other units that I've been seeing during the surge. Um, because he basically was saying, look, we've we've been here for a few months already. We're, you know, and um, this isn't a place where the coin stuff is working. Um, this is a place where the time for expanding is over. Um, and he was very frank and, and upfront about that, um, which was surprising to me um, and really interesting to me and kind of an immediate hook for, OK, what's going on in this place? And then, you know, the next day, drive out with his sergeant major to uh, to Cot, Michigan at the mouth of the Korangal Valley and you you know, within the first few hours, you see it. You know, the, the company commander or first sergeant says, well, okay, be prepared for, you know, two or three, uh, you know, attacks from all these surrounding mountains during a, a day, during your during your stay here. Uh, you know, next one will probably be at about 7 p.m. And <laughs> lo and behold, that's exactly what happens. Um, 
and you you realize yeah it's just a very different kind of fight it's um these are these little outposts are they're in fish bowls on the valley floor um they're like these little concrete fortresses concrete and hesco barriers um but the enemy can see everything that's going on inside of them except if it has camouflage netting or a roof over it because the enemy is just in the hills above yeah which doesn't stop bullets or rpgs <laughs> right um and uh, yeah and and just just there was just this routine of um you know two or three times a day in would come the you know it might start with a, a bunch of rpgs either on the outpost or at the little ANA observation post on the hill above, uh, and then there would be there would be recoilless rifles. There'd be there was an AGS nineteen, I think it was called, like Soviet grenade launcher, automatic grenade hmm. launcher, essentially the no, AGS seventeen is whatever it was is the equivalent of a Mark nineteen. Yeah, um, that, which is a forty millimeter awesome <laughs> grenade hucker. Right. And so this thing would be, this thing would be peppering Cop Michigan with uh, you know Fuck. with fire from the mountains. Um, and there was just it was just a very high volume of incoming fire and also a very high volume of outgoing fire. I mean, I think I probably saw almost certainly saw more artillery and mortars fired during that trip to Kunar than during all of my cumulative every other embed and every other place in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. It's not surprising to hear actually. Did you notice a difference in uh, just the demeanor of the soldiers? In those areas, um, yeah. I mean, in some way, I mean, I'm thinking of in the summer of 2010. I was coming from having been in Sangin earlier in the in the trip, which was the most horrible place I've ever been, and where these British Marines really were just they were just sucking down. There were just so many IEDs, a guy stepping on them all the time. It was just this routine in the district. So in some ways, the Pesh kind of felt like a you know a relief from that. I mean, yeah. it was just this this whole different thing with the um, with the the type of fighting, but like I remember being struck by, I remember being struck by just kind of how routine it was to the guys at this little outpost, yeah. Cot Michigan. Um, it was like they were dealing with weather, you know, the way they talk about it. it think about like, think about how amazing it is for you yourself having experienced this to describe going from an IED infested area to a place where you're in the low ground receiving <laughs> plunging fire. As a relief <laughs> or a break, <laughs> but the funny thing just, about it, it is, just, it provides some uh, insight into the situation sure, with which sure. you became normalized to. Right? Um, <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, but that these guys were much more normalized to, right? Yeah. Like I remember, you know, it would be kind of thing where um, I remember, like during one uh, one firefight during an, an evening one night at Michigan, I was tra- tagging along with the company first sergeant wherever he went as he ran around the base checking on different you know, the mortar pit and yep. this and that. Um, and I remember like one of the mortarmen being like, first sergeant, you're not running around out in this, are you? And it sounded like he was talking about like hail or heavy rain or something. Um, or, you know, being in the the little MWR trailer where guys could check their, you know, check their email and stuff. Um, and one of these attacks kicking off and, you know, hearing two guys talking about like, eh, I think I'm going to s- stay inside for this one, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so it, it's only, it's a light drizzle <laughs> yeah, exactly. of lead. That's what it sounded like. I mean, they, they yeah. were very attuned to the difference between a light drizzle attack and a, uh, you know, and a heavy downpour attack. Yeah. Uh, and similarly, though, the enemy was very attuned to the U.S. response. Uh, and this was what was, you know, pretty immediately clear looking at the patch in 2010 and then going and reading news articles about the patch a few years earlier was that the war had really changed there. Um, these outposts they had started their lives as much more precarious little positions um, with much less kind of cover and much less separation between you and the population that you're living around from the perspective of the U.S. troops. Because they were supposed to be these coin security bubbles. Yeah. They're supposed to be, you're not supposed to live on your outpost. You're supposed to sleep there and patrol from it constantly. And by 2010, that wasn't what these, wasn't what was happening anymore. What was happening at that point was um, these were little fortresses, um, troops, they ventured out, um, you know, on, on foot patrols, was like going into space. Um, or they would get in their big armored vehicles and, you know, these big MRAPs. Um, and there wasn't, you know, there was not this kind of, th- the same kind of friendly, close interaction with the local people that there had been a few years earlier. Um, and you could tell, even not having been there before, you could tell this is a place where kind of things have grown cold between yeah. the U.S. troops oh, who live there and the people. Um, and, and so, you know, from the enemy perspective, uh, you could just imagine uh, it's it's so predictable for them too. In the same way that the U.S. company commander knows, like, okay, next attack's probably going to be around seven. Um, 
the enemy knows, okay, from the moment that we start shooting, we have X minutes until the outpost's mortars start hitting, then X more minutes until the 155 howitzers from Blessing start hitting, and X more minutes until Apaches show up, and X more minutes until, you know, the 2,000 pound bombs yep. from the fixed wing planes start hitting. So you really and, got the impression. Yep. I mean, it's like, you know, this was a dangerous place, Cop Michigan, but it wasn't dangerous like these places had been a few years earlier in the sense that this had all been... Come, this, this all was a drill now, and there was so much fortification and cover um, that, you know, guys were being hurt and killed. I mean, there was a mechanic was killed on Cop, Michigan shortly before I visited. I remember at least one guy was wounded, you know, lightly during during that visit. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't what it had been a few years before. And similarly, you had to you had to know that up in the hills, uh, the enemy knew exactly when to step under that boulder. Yeah. They probably were not taking a real beating from this, you know, this this massive barrage of firepower. Uh, there was all this ordnance being expended, but both sides were pretty, you know, they kind of had it down what their what their role in this in this play was. And then who's stuck in the middle is the people that live there. You'd have to imagine too that the enemy had a pretty good idea of the capabilities of both the aircraft, manned or unmanned, that the U.S. had. The weather conditions that could affect it, days where the low hanging fog, absolutely. Completely, I mean, even in my own limited experience in those areas, when you realize as a U.S. service member, like shit, we're kind of limited right now with our uh, our assets and our support. Shocker, we're getting attacked. Right. Today's the day we're getting more. Like they get it too. Um, you know, underestimating your enemy and their ability to keep track of those things has led to more than one person's downfall. Yeah, I mean, and, and the most ferocious fights that I describe in the book, you know, not from my own perspective, not that I wasn't there for those, but from, you know, reconstructing big operations, uh, key points along the way with, with guys who fought up there, um, the, wor- the, the worst stuff would happen um, in periods when there was weather that was keeping keeping uh, aircraft away, um, periods when it just, it was early in the war and aircraft were farther away to start with. Um, there are some hard limits to kind of the the air power advantage um, yeah. that the terrain and the weather and the vegetation up there pose. Um, there are, uh, you know, we like to think of, we can think of, you know, reapers and predators as these kind of all-seeing eyes that let you, not you know, look remotely. at the battlefield, but they're really not, and yeah. they especially weren't early on, and they especially weren't for conventional units, which only had them as kind of like a rare luxury, rather than as like, a, okay, every time we go out, we've got an AC-130 and a, and a reaper looking over our shoulder. Um, and so there really there were a lot of moments um, over the course of, of time up there where U.S. infantry platoons found themselves locked into very intense, very close range combat with a very ferocious and disciplined enemy uh, in in the pine forest, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, just in, in a place where uh, air power is not going to help you. One of the things that um, surprised me about the book, again, I've spent time in Afghanistan, but like I was saying when we started, half the time it's just like, I just get in the 47, and mm-hmm. when the 47 gets off, I look for the structure that looks like the one that's on this GRG that I have on my hand. The number of repetitive operations into the same area that had the same result, it's not its not awe-inspiring. No, it certainly isn't. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know if that's a lack of information or after action reports or them not having the ability to share information but there was some catastrophic loss of life specifically when they were trying to go deep into the patch uh i forget the names of the exact areas but they would go to these same areas and you know there would be senior members in the army in the country not directly involved in that but had tried the same thing before got their ass handed to them which is the only way that you can describe it and then here American forces are trying it again with the exact same result. That's di- that type of stuff to me, it's uh, it's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. I mean, it's it's um, there's a place called the Waterpore Valley in particular um, where U.S. troops, they never built an outpost, but um, they uh, the, the enemy kind of had a sanctuary up there. It's the place where the enemy took Paul Revstall when they when they had him captive or during his sort of visit slash captivity. This is the guy who has the wheelbarrow because <laughs> exactly, of his balls. Yes. Okay, yeah. um, but so this was you know way up in the Waterpore Valley, um, up uh, up in the what they called the Gambier Jungle. You know, really thick forest. Um, the enemy just they were safe up there. Um, 
they early on um, U.S. troops, when there were sort of fewer restrictions on them, uh, U.S. infantry platoons would hike up there or go up there on ATVs or pickup trucks. But over the years, as um, as as the U.S. force becomes heavier and heavier, first it's kind of locked into its Humvees. Now it's locked into its up-armored Humvees. Now it's locked into its MRAPs. Kind of the, the and for people listening, a lot of that was theater guidance, meaning you didn't have a choice. Exactly. You knew that a dirt bike or a horse or an ATV would be better. <clears throat> But you literally would get guidance saying you're not leaving the wire unless you are in uh, a armored vehicle that can withstand this level of protection or charge. No, that's exactly right. It's because as as the IED threat had grown, um, there was this constant back and forth between uh, mobility and protection. Uh, the enemy gets better and better at the bombs. You get better and better at the armor and the countermeasures. But what you lose is mobility unless yeah. you're willing to you know take losses. Um, and there's an interesting parallel here. Maybe parallel isn't quite the right word, but to the Soviet experience in Kunar, because we have, I, I think we as Americans, uh, especially you know Americans who've spent time around the military and around Afghanistan, we often have what I think is a pretty false impression of the way the Soviets behaved, at least in this part of the country, um, up at Kunar, um, where we think they just they were this blundering armored behemoth that just would get sucked up into these valleys and chopped up and lose hundreds of soldiers. Um, and I think we, we get that perception from Afghans, because that's who we talked to about it. That's who, you know, the DIA people and the reporters were talking to in the 80s about the it. The victor gets to tell the story. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> or the only person left behind. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but so th the reality, I mean, going back and looking at, you know, um, translated Russian Soviet documents, you know, finding finding Soviet veterans of this place to talk to, Soviet veterans forums, I mean, the equivalent of like Facebook groups that court, that American Korengal veterans maintain for themselves. Um, the, the Soviets went through this evolution in Kunar where they came in blundering and heavy like that in their big armored vehicles, but they adapted and became flexible. Um, and they, they increasingly spent time in small little foot patrols way up in the mountains, uh, you know, days and weeks at a time, uh, almost more like Mac V. Sog kind of looking stuff uh, than what you wind up seeing U.S. troops doing. Yeah. And so U.S. troops undergo the opposite evolution. You know, they show up light and flexible in small numbers of, you know, Green Berets and Rangers and SEALs and Marines in the early years. And then over time, as casualties mount, um, and as it's become, it's very clear that you know our our our, our country and our national leadership has no appetite for these casualties. Um, more and more of these rules are and restrictions are imposed on these units, so that by 2010, it's okay. Vehicles leaving the wire, it has to be at least four MRAPs. Yeah. Uh, whereas in 2006, it was, um, well, yeah, go go up to Gambier in your ATVs. Um, when I first went over 2000, like I said, my first uh, trip there was 2002. That was for Karzai's security detail, though. Then 2003, we were back over there. We were rolling around in Hilux. Right. Which is like a, what would you say, like a Tacoma-ish, yeah. basically, truck. But they're badass. They're like a <laughs> Tacoma, but actually badass. And I actually really like Tacomas, but Hiluxes are awesome. <laughs> Thin-skinned. Uh a bullet of any caliber will zip right through that thing and no protection from explosives, but they are so incredibly mobile. And then it became Humvees and wraps. And by the time I went back in 2010, it was side by sides. And we went to the most inhospitable terrain in the hopes that there would be no IEDs buried because that's the only way we could escape the IED threat. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in the Pesh, the evolution that you see is as the U.S. forces become more roadbound, more stuck in their MRAPs, uh, it, it, the only way to get up to these places where the enemy lives starts being with big helicopter air assaults. Um, now, ideally, these conventional forces would be doing it something more like how special operations forces did it, right? Like sort of quick responsive raids with small forces. But there's so few helicopters in the theater for conventional forces um, that they are this they're this closely husbanded resource. Everything, you know, this is true of the, uh, you know, of the Chinooks that are the only helicopters that really are going to, you know, haul guys in any numbers uh, yeah. up into these mountains. It's true of the Apaches that escort them. It's true of the Reapers and Predators. And it winds up being the case that the only way for a conventional infantry battalion to get access to these resources is to plan far in advance a big named operation, as they call it, an air assault operation with multiple companies of guys going up into the mountains with a cool code name. Yeah. Uh, and, and so this becomes the routine. Is Which take weeks of planning, coordination. And for people listening, when we're talking about Chinooks, think of a 46 or a 47. That ma they look like a school bus with two uh, rotor blade uh, pylons on the top versus your traditional Black Hawk, um, which would oftentimes, especially if they're the 160th birds have the fuel probes actually coming out of both the 47s and the 60s. But uh, Blackhawk 
literally just go look up a Black Hawk versus a Chinook. Two very different things. Chinook's much more powerful, two rotor blades, a lot of people. Uh, I think their forward speed is actually faster if it was a race, but they take longer to slow down, they take longer to speed up, and they are oftentimes bullet and RPG sponges. Right. They present a really big target um, for the enemy at the best of times, but especially up in these forests where there are only a very small number of yep. clearings that are big enough to accommodate a Chinook. And the enemy knows that. They know exactly where these clearings are. They get used over and over again in these different missions. Um, and, you know, as units rotate through, it's just this um, it's this game of, you know, it's a game of telephone kind of, you know, each unit knows what the previous unit told it. And then it kind of doesn't really know anything back beyond that for the most part. Um, so you may, you get this reinvention of the wheel over and over again, right? Unit A comes in and takes A approach. Unit B comes in and says, well, that wasn't working. We're going to take B approach. Unit C comes in and says, well, that didn't seem like it worked. Let's do unit A. Let's do approach A again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, then, and meanwhile, the local populace is sitting there looking at you going, what the fuck? Right. And like you said, exhausted, maybe generationally exhausted, like we were saying. Maybe they lived through the Soviet invasion and... Yeah, you get to some of these areas and you can tell by the way that they look at you that <clears throat> you're not in friendly territory, right. for sure. And there's a real evolution that you can see um, both in talking to people who lived up in the patch and Americans who served there and the attitudes that people have toward U.S. troops. I'll give the example of um, there was a, a Green Beret team in uh, the first Green Beret team to live at Fob Blessing in the Petch Valley in 2004. Uh, sort of toward the end of their six months had a tragic accident where one of the Green Berets um, shot one of these, you know, mangy, horrible dogs that was kind of menacing him on patrol. And uh, the bullet went through the dog, hit a rock, ricocheted, and killed a local shopkeeper. Um, and the Green Beret team captain thinks, well, shit, this is it. This is it. You know, they're going to kick us out of the fire base. We're going to have to close down operations. The people aren't going to stand for this. Um, but in fact, um, the community does stand for it. And uh, the local elders kind of help him organize the right way of sort of paying, uh, paying condolence, amends. making amends with the family. Um, there are some demonstrations, but the local local leaders kind of calm it down, explain, look, the guy who did this was a guy you all know. Um, and because it was a good faith mistake. Um, but over time, um, too many good faith mistakes uh, yeah. don't sit well. Um, and, and over time, as these units rotate through, um, every one of these units, you know, it does, whether it's six months or 12 months, uh, they have a rough first few weeks. And we often think about that in terms of, yeah, the first few weeks are really dangerous for U.S. troops as they kind of get their feet under them and learn what they're doing. But those first few weeks are really dangerous for the local people around the U.S. troops, too, um, as, as U.S. troops kind of figure out what is and isn't a threat. Uh, and often that's when you would see, you know, escalation of force incidents when somebody, you know, uh, machine gunner shoots shoots through the window of a pickup truck or a, an, an incoming car that probably, you know, they were within their rights to do it. But by the end of the deployment, maybe they wouldn't have because they understand the patterns of life better. Yeah, they haven't they haven't allowed they don't have enough experience to understand how it breathes. Right. The, exactly. The ebb and flow of the interaction and what looks out of place, because when you're brand new. Everything looks out of place. I'd actually say the first 90 and the last 90, uh, well, depending on the duration of your deployment, maybe right. the first 30 and the last 30. First 30 because you don't know shit, last 30 because you're bumping up against complacency. Yeah. And just wanting to turn over and get the hell out of there. There's an interesting phenomenon that you see kind of play out in the Korangal. Um, you see it play out in lots of different places, but the Korangal is a good example um, where, you know, the, the war in Afghanistan, it kind of works on an annual cycle in a lot of ways, in a few ways, right? Um, in one way, U.S. troops often were there on, you know, U.S. Army units were there on one-year rotations for yep. a lot of the war. So they'd arrive in the spring, and then they'd go home the following spring. Or they'd arrive in the fall, go home the following fall. Whatever the particular, you know, rotation pattern in that province was that's kind of set up by chance earlier in the war. Um, similarly, um, the enemy kind of comes and goes in a, in a seasonal in a seasonal pattern. There are there are year round fighters, and depending on the area you're looking at, this may be more or less true. But there are year round fighters who just are people who live there or are kind of real pros who 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 just stick it out the whole time. And then there are all kinds of out of area fighters who come in, you know, from a, from across the border from Pakistan for various purposes. You know, in Kunar, sometimes it was it seemed like it was kind of the equivalent of a capstone exercise or to get their combat infantry badge. You know, their yeah. Taliban CIB. Um, Similar to why people were finding their way to Iraq as well. Right. Um, and so, 
but something that you and and then and a lot of it and then this is this is affected by the seasons too right like the winters can be pretty harsh the summers can be pretty miserable um but during the winter like in the south there's less vegetation to, for enemy to hide around so it makes sense to just not stick around um in up in you know up in kunar like there can be a ton of snow up in those mountain passes that make it hard to move around yeah but so something you see with these big air assaults is um and with the you know the rotation of units coming through um is you know, in the Korengal, an infantry company would deploy in the spring or summer. They'd have a really hard first few months. They'd take guys killed. They'd kill a lot of bad guys. In the fall, they, you know, they'd get a big air assault operation in, kill a lot of bad guys. And then things would quiet down. And the question would be, okay, well, are things quieting down because we killed a lot of them and inflicted losses that they're not quickly recovering from? Or are they quieting down because this is the natural rhythm of when the enemy goes back to Pakistan to hibernate and do what they do in Pakistan? Um, and then in the Korangal, what you'd see happen was in the spring, then it would stay quiet. So the infantry company would think, okay, it really was us. We, you know, we we have turned the tide in this place. We we've gotten things. We've kind of we've we've made real progress. Um, and then they'd go home, and a new infantry company would come in and immediately get slammed. <laughs> Because it's yeah. the enemy is just wait, the enemy doesn't want to fight you at the end of your tour when you really know what you're doing uh, with you know a yeah they want to the fight the new guys goal. yeah uh, and so then you see it repeat itself and because it's this one year cycle it happens over and over again and you know U S units don't really observe the pattern because they're not there for it yeah yeah and there's not that uh, there's not a great transmission of a, of that experience whether it be written or verbal because you're lifting and shifting entire units out of the area. And who knows if anybody who's coming in, whether they're, you know, National Guard, active duty, where they're from, what they specialize in. I mean, it's kind of a it's kind of a crapshoot to a degree. Yeah. And sort of the passing knowledge down was one of the real weak points. I mean, the military tried and it did a lot of different it took a lot of different um, approaches to trying to make institutional knowledge work in this war of unit rotations. Um, but the war of unit rotations is kind of inherently crippled by that. Right. Because you've got these big groups of people just you know, leaving and coming and going and coming and going. Um, and, you know, in some units like the Ranger Battalions or, or other soft units, they may wind up coming back to the same place, right? Like, you know, the past 10, past 10, 20 years, you know, Ranger units have been rotating in and out of Afghanistan in a very predictable pattern. And yep. it is true, true of your old unit too, although it's sort of had more of a geographic diversity. Um, but with conventional units, it, it would be they deploy to this place and then they'd never see it again. Um, and so, you know, all you had was the, you know, two week overlap period with the outgoing unit and they try to, if they were, if they were, you know, if they were good, they try to dump as much information into you guys' brains, uh, as they possibly could during that two week period. But there's really only so much that can be, that can be dumped in during that two week period. Now, some of the heroes yeah. of the story, I think are, um, there are people who had the long view. Um, <clears throat> there are interpreters who had the long view. Uh, you know, Afghans who were working with the U.S. military who uh, didn't go home at the end of a year, who just they lived in the they they you know, they were on an interpreter contract and they worked for this unit for its 12 months. And then they worked for the next unit and they worked for the next unit. And so if you had good interpreters and were willing to listen to them, uh, they could be a really good sort of institutional knowledge resource. And then also there was this there was this army unit. There was a blend of contractors and soldiers called the Asymmetric Warfare Group. Um, and AWG is a, a funny organization that I mean I think some people have you know have had experiences with them in Iraq and Afghanistan where they didn't seem to be very useful. It wasn't clear what they were doing there. Um, but in the patch, they were a real value added. Um, there were you know a series of very senior, very experienced former operator type guys for the most part um, who took it upon themselves to uh, plug in during these transitions and kind of shepherd the new unit through. Uh, and, and try to you know accustom them more than the two week turnover period allowed uh, to all the nuances and tricks of fighting in this particular area. And now this didn't translate into you know these guys having an effect on you know the outcome, right? Like they did, they didn't make units kind of do better, but they saved lives. Yeah. And I think at this sort of this micro tactical level of fire teams and squads and platoons, um, you know, s surviving their early months. Um, uh, the, the AWG guys were really, really useful, um, and their 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 you know their story is one that hasn't been told so much. And I tried to tried to do a little bit of the of justice to that in the book. Well, the continuity between those leaving and those coming in over multiple rotations is like that knowledge is gold, right? Whether or not the person you're trying to pass that knowledge on to, that's the variable. 
Right. Um, you, you see it a little bit, you know, if people want to go and get a visual representation of that a little bit, or maybe even what living and fighting in these valleys might be like, I'd be interested in your take on it, but there is a pretty good documentary, Restrepo. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Restrepo is a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal film. It, it shows the isolated nature of where they are, how it's, they're defending where they are. They go out on these patrols. Nobody's happy to see them. They're not necessarily happy. The U.S. isn't necessarily happy to see anybody. They're not happy to see the U.S. But there's that, you know, that isolation, the geographical, topographical. But there's also, it's, it shows up a few times in the Shura or the key leader engagement where the senior officer now says, that was the old guy. Right. This is the way we're doing it forward. And I have to believe that every person who is filling that person's shoes says the same thing. And Absolutely. I, I look at it through the lens of myself. How many times would I be willing to tolerate being told that, but not having it lived up to? Yeah, you can see, I mean, the um, uh, the guy, and so Restrepo is sort of a depiction of a year in the life, basically. One right, one infantry company yep. um, doing the Korangal thing, living at this little series of outposts. Uh, and the guy in command of that company during that rotation is a guy named Dan Kearney, who's one of several kind of recurring characters in the book, because he winds up in the Ranger Regiment and having further involvement with the Petch through that organization. Yep. Um, but yeah, you can see him uh, in, in, in the documentary. You can see his kind of frustration with uh, arriving in this place where the people already hate him. Was he the captain, the one who was saying, I want that building destroyed now? Yes. Okay. That's, that's, that's uh, yeah, Captain, then Captain Kearney. Okay. Is um, he still in? He is still in. I believe he is at, he's in 06. He's a full board colonel now. 14 yeah. star general by this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he did. Um, he, he took a battalion back as a, an 82nd Airborne Battalion commander okay. a couple years ago. Um, and yeah, he's a, he's a colonel now. Yeah, because I believe he was a captain in that, which is he an 03 for the yeah, Army. Yeah, that's right. He was. Yeah. Um, that was his second deployment. He had been a platoon leader in Mosul in, uh, as, as a lieutenant in 2004, 2005, something like that. And then he was um, this battalion's youngest company commander uh, during the, the 15 months that the 2503 infantry, this paratroop battalion, spent in the Pesh and the Korangal. And yeah, you can, yeah. See, you can see him kind of- um, Navigating all the stuff you're yeah, talking about. Talking to, talking to these local elders and just being like, hey, forget about what happened with Captain McKnight and attack company before me like I'm here now battle company is here now let's forget about what happened and of and course in, and in their head they're like yeah but the guy before you told us that right. who told us that before the guy but told him that right before the other, and they're just like eat all the dicks and there sometimes are these scenes like there's one scene that was recounted to me by a bunch of different guys who were present for it where it's the next unit after Kearney's battle company is a unit called Viper Company from the 1st Infantry Division, which in many ways was a much less well-prepared unit that really the Army did a terrible disservice to by putting in, in this part of the country. I mean, it was a brand new infantry unit, stood up from nothing, um, with NCOs who were kind of dragged in from all different places in the Army, guys who had hadn't deployed, guys who were coming from mechanized infantry units. Um, so, you know, great brand new soldiers, great brand new officers, really not a lot of senior NCOs with any kind of experience. Uh, and they have a really tough time early on, uh, but they go through this same cycle where, you know, they, they have a tough time. They kind of eventually get their mountain legs under them. They really put the hurt on the enemy. Um, and in the spring, it's quiet again. And in that space in the spring, sometimes you would see kind of more candid interactions between uh, the officers and interpreters of these companies on the one hand and the elders who they're dealing with in which the elders kind of let down the mask a little bit and are talk more candidly about the Soviet experience and things like that. So there's this one scene that I recount in the book where essentially um, it's, it's, you know, it's Viper Company's spring. They've only got a couple months left in their deployment. Um, and w one of these elders, Zalbor Khan or Shamshir Khan, who are these sort of the two, the, the big wigs that the Americans would, would interact with directly uh, at the Korangal outpost during these weekly meetings. Um, they're sitting down with the, you know, the company commander, uh, uh, and and basically they tell him like hey like look we've been we've been through all this before like you say you're building a road but you don't really build the road um so we sit and talk to you because we're because you're here we sit and talk to the taliban because they're here we sat and talked to the soviets because they were here um and, and it being you know the, the the company commander a guy named jimmy howell um uh, describes that as being a pretty eye-opening interaction for him i mean just getting that level the of dude's being honest yeah first off i'd like to meet the person who could build a road there <laughs> right. <laughs> I want to meet the engineer and the construction company that could actually, without being uh, attacked by PKM and RPG fire, let's take that out of the equation. Right. Could build a road there 
that's going to stand up to what that valley has to well, offer. Well, that's the trick. You can build a road there, but you can't keep a road there. That's what and I'm saying. Yeah. That would stay for the long term. Right. Um, and and that's that was is the fatal flaw in all of this U.S. funded road building uh, that happened up in the Petchenit side valleys is it needs to be a road that then once Americans are all gone and there's very limited local budget ha- can be sustained. You know, in the early nineties, yeah, and in the early nineties, I mean, there were NGOs that were working up in Kunar that were trying to do that. They were trying to uh, they were trying to put roads that were sort of locally built and sustained in places where they could be sustained. And you know those places did not include the Corongal Valley. That's yeah. not it's not one of the places that they tried to do it. But you see, not by choice, yeah, by topography, right? And you see, I mean, the, the road thing is so fascinating. I mean, we mentioned the phrase, uh, you know, ink blots earlier because this is one of the mantras of counterinsurgency that we get from you know the French in the late 19th century is ink ink blots or oil splots. Uh, the idea is you kind of you put down a little a little little presence of counterinsurgents and they gradually spread their bubble of influence. And, you know, around 2005, 2006, there was a variation on this that was very in vogue uh, in the U.S. military in Afghanistan that was ink lines. The idea is the roads are going to be the blots. Oh, the arteries for the Yeah, ink. and the roads are going to be kind of, you know, the government influence will spread from the roads. Um, and there, you know, there winds up being some truth to this, but also there are communities that don't want the roads uh, and that will ferociously resist the arrival of the roads. Uh, and the Korangal is one of these places. Uh, and you see this evolution from it's again it's this as units come and go there's mission creep that happens, you know the, the first unit that decides they want to pave a road in the Korangal, um, does it for very uh, limited practical reasons. Essentially, they have they have built this outpost in the middle of the Korangal, the Korangal outpost. There are not a lot of helicopters in theater. Um, and they need to be able to resupply the outpost. So the idea is widen and flatten this existing kind of dirt and gravel track that leads from the mouth of the valley to the Korangal outpost so that larger vehicles can can handle it uh, and, and so that it's easier to spot IEDs, harder to plant IEDs. Um, but uh, over time, this th- this idea, the concept of the road grows. So the next unit that's in, you know, a year later, it has a diff- totally different idea of what this road is there for. It doesn't think it's there as like kind of this narrow counter IED supply route. It thinks this road is sort of, this is going to bring the writ of the government into the valley and transform the valley. And not only that, but we're going to push it way up the back of the valley and it's going to come down the other side of the valley through these mountain passes, you know, 8,000 feet up. Um, and that's not something that's, you know, that was a that was a, a wild dream, essentially. Like I said, I'd like to meet the yeah. architect, engineer, and construction company that yeah. could do that. Yeah, I mean, and it's it really it's it's kind of incredible some of the stuff that the military thought it could accomplish. But there's I know, would choose a different word, but I'll go with that one for today. Incredible. I, I think there's a lot about the culture of the army uh, and the culture of army leaders um, that makes it hard to say no. Makes it hard to recognize when missions are not accomplishable. I mean, there's this this paratroop battalion two five zero three that you see in Restrepo and that takes up a couple chapters of the book. They have it's it's almost like too perfect for you know to be believed. But they on their on their PowerPoint slides for all their con ops for operations and their briefings about roads and briefings about outposts and briefings about handing out beanie babies and whatever. Um, they have uh, if it's possible, it's been done. If it's impossible, we'll do it. And that really is the attitude that a lot of these units went up there with, was no task is too hard for us. We're the United States Army. Um, and it, it kind of, it takes, uh, in some ways, it takes a, a very different kind of unit and a very different kind of commander to change the direction that the ship is going. You get, in 2008 to 2009, you get this 1st Infantry Division Battalion that gets sent up there, the Blue Spaders, who are in no way, shape, or form prepared for what they're getting into. They're this brand new unit that I was referring to a minute ago, and they just, they have a really hard time, um, and their battalion commander is not a guy who is on his ways to General Stars, and he knows it. Uh, he's a guy who had previously been passed over for battalion command, and then gets one because the army builds a bunch of new battalions, and it, you know, it, it, it so it's sweet. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, but he's the first guy who looks at this place and says, no, this isn't doable, um, which I think is, you know, a really it says something really fascinating about the army and the qualities that it kind of that it that it looks for in its leaders, right? Is that it's it, it takes this guy who is kind of was on a very different path uh, to look realistically at the Korangal Valley and, and what it had become, and tell his higher leaders, "We need to get out of this place." Maybe, maybe it had something to do with the fact that he knew that he could see the end of the tracks in his own personal career that he felt. 
more empowered or emboldened to speak honestly. I have yeah. a hard time believing that the other military leaders at some point at the back of their head were going, son of a bitch. Like, I hear what you're saying that we should be doing. However, a rational human being looking at this, are you telling me after you spend a year embedded there in that valley that you're still going to have these aspirations of a road winding through sure, it yeah. up and over the top? I don't think that you actually are. But if you have aspirations of stars, perhaps you are more reserved in the feedback that you give and the way that you portray yourself. Who knows? I can't speak for anybody in that I think situation. You can also, but I think you can also believe your own Kool-Aid. You can you can really if you think well, the army and mil the military is going to teach you to think like that. Don't talk yeah. to me about what can't be done. Come to me with solutions. Exactly. And there's a value to that. Right. But it's it's so let's call it a knife. It can cut you as well as it can cut something else. So it's a tool that I think perhaps has to be used a little bit more judiciously because you talk about it in the book. At some point, the U.S. military, I'm not going to say they threw their hands up, but they started realizing we need to get the fuck out of here. Right. And what year was that? Did it really change? Um, it changes in increments. Um, the first place that they that they look at it and they say, "Wait a minute, we extended too far." Is the Weigal Valley north of the Petch? So one of uh, the opposite side of the Petch from the Korangal. So in the Korangal, they've built a bunch of outposts. In the Weigal, they've built a bunch of outposts. And at the same time that they're saying we're going to pave the road over the top of the mountain in the Korangal, uh, the same unit and the same commanders look at the Weigal and say, uh, "I think we've we have extended a little bit too far here uh, for comfort." This realization comes about after a, a battle in August 2007, where the farthest, the most remote, most northerly one of these outposts, which is called the Ranch House, um, it's on this uh, above this little mountainside town called Arans. You know, just one of these towns that is just looks like it should slide down the mountain. Um, and one morning, this outpost gets slammed, and insurgents get inside the wire, like the kind of stuff that you you, you read about from Vietnam, right? Yeah, you're talking about they were throwing hand grenades back and forth at each other. Exactly inside the base. Yep. Um, and miraculously, no Americans are killed in this in in this assault. Um, the uh, you know A10s arrive and and save the day. Um, but that that one is a wake up call for the 173rd Airborne Brigade leadership at Jalalabad, and they say, okay, let's get out of the Weigal. And correct me if I'm wrong, that for whatever reason they were. It took a long time for them to get reinforcements, which I think might have been that aha moment. Right. Like, we can't do this anymore. There was no road access. Yeah. To, um, That's it, right. It was a helicopter only outpost. A helicopter outpost. only outpost. Yep. And even the next nearest outpost, Bella, um, was a helicopter mostly outpost, basically. Um, but so what winds up, it winds up being much harder to get out of these places than it was to get in. And that's a, you know, a recurring theme of the story is, you know, early in the war when there's not a lot of rules and you can go wherever in ATVs and there's not IEDs everywhere yet. And the insurgency is just sort of more of a low key simmering thing. Um, it's really easy to say, OK, we're going to put an outpost up in this up on this mountain way north of the Petch Valley um, and, you know, send a company up there and they do it and they start building the outpost. But then three years later. It's a lot harder to leave. Yeah. Um, well, you have there, a lot of infrastructure, right? You generators. Have a lot of, and, generators. There are treadmills that need to come out. There are. There's. You know. All kind. Just all kinds of stuff. Typically, the outpost has grown in terms of the size of the garrison because enemy resistance has gotten more. So you need more troops to fight it off. Um, you've had guys die there. Um, sometimes the outpost is named after one of those guys. Um, and it becomes uh, something that has to be decided by the four-star general back in Kabul, um, whether we can leave this outpost. Um, and it requires all these resources. You know, it requires all, all the same kinds of in-demand resources that these units are all competing over for their air assaults. Chinook helicopters in particular are the same resources that you need to come out of these outposts. And it's always really hard for these, you know, for division headquarters or wherever to prioritize kind of a retreat from somewhere over all these air assaults that all these battalions in the, in, yeah. in the country are clamoring to do. So it winds up taking forever to get out of any of these places. Um, you know, the ranch house takes, it's like a, um, you know, they, in theory, they know they want to come out of it. Then the battle happens. And it's just sort of by, by the grace of God that no, no Americans are killed in the battle. Even from then, it takes like another six, seven weeks um, to, to close that outpost. Um, then it takes until the following spring to close the next outpost. Um, and then you see it you see it happen again in the Korangal with the subsequent unit. You know, the subsequent unit decide reaches the same conclusions about the Korangal. This guy, Colonel Jenkinson, um, the, the commander who changed the course of the ship in the Korangal. Mm -hmm. um, he spends his whole deployment, you know, yelling to his superiors about we need to get out of the Korangal. We need to get out of the Korangal. Um, and it, 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 it essentially seems to him the whole time like nobody's listening. 
Um, and in fact, you know, his, his superiors are listening, but they're not accepting his recommendations. Um, and in part, that's because there is this, by that point, after, you know, three years of U.S. rifle companies living in the Korangal and guys being killed in the Korangal, there's this emotional attachment at that point. There's this, we don't want to admit retreat. You know, this road is paved in blood. We can't just leave. Um, you know, this this outpost is named after this paratrooper. Or, are we going to abandon it to the enemy? Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's the sunk cost fallacy. Um, and it takes, it, so it, it takes, only, only it, ta- it takes until the next unit in 2009 um, to actually get approval to come out of the Korangal. And then it takes until the spring of 2010 to actually do it. Um, because it takes months and months and months uh, to, to muster the resources uh, to actually close these outposts. How far did they actually back out? I know you talked about it in the book because they pulled out of, it was a past blessing. So yeah, so it happens in stages. In 2010, they leave the Korangal, but they're still in the Petch. Yep. Um, so by the and again, t- these valleys they kind of they all lead into the Petch, right? Right. It looks like um, it looks like if you imagine a leaf, um, and it has a good all these little branch, all these little spines leading into the you know the central spine of the leaf. That central spine is the Petch, and then all these little little ar- arteries coming into it are the tributaries, like the Weigal and the Korangal and the Shuriak and so on. And so th- they leave these little tributaries before they leave the Petch. By um, uh, the summer of 2010, when I first visit the Petch, it's down to four, the four main outposts on the Petch proper. It's Fob Blessing, Cop Michigan, Cop Abel Maine, and Cop Honaker Miracle. And so then Cop is combat outpost, right. Fob is forward operating, forward operating base. base. Cop being smaller than a Fob. Exactly. They're sort of, they're not well-defined terms, but Fob is bigger than Cop. Yep. Um, and so summer of 2010, um, what's happened is, you know, this... Um, uh, 101st Airborne Division unit that I'm visiting. Uh, it's called the 1327 Infantry Battalion, the Bulldogs. It's led by this Colonel Joe Ryan, who's the guy who kind of um, I, I describe being really interested by how candid he was about it being time to leave this valley uh, when I talked to him during the visit. Um, the, the, the backdrop is they've come in in the spring, and the previous unit has just finally extricated itself from the Korangal after spending all year Trying to, trying to do it, trying to muster the resources and get all the approvals and everything to come out of the Korangal. But what you see happen in the weeks after the Korangal pullout is all that intensity of combat, uh, intensity of enemy attacks that was focused on the Korangal outpost and its little sister outposts, Restrepo, Vimoto, deep in the Korangal Valley. Now that those outposts are gone, all that Korangali energy and ordnance gets focused on Cop Michigan at the mouth of the valley. It's like water slamming up against the next obstacle. Exactly. And so what happens now is the war has come to the Petch Road. Um, you know, in 2006, 2007, the war was up in the tributaries. The fighting was up in the Weigal and the Korangal, in these little remote outposts. And they, they were providing kind of a space and time with what these guys would call, military guys would call white space, um, for this, this development and nation building to happen down on the Petch Road. You know, there wasn't an American killed on the Petch Road um, between, I think it was June or July 2006, and then it wasn't until the summer of 2009 that they started taking losses down on the Petch Road itself again. Now, by the summer of 2010, that's where all of the fighting is, because that's where all the all the U.S. troops have left there. Yeah. Um, so it's just it's right along this road, this you know beautiful, shiny new road that has been built um, over the preceding years and has actually has caused a real kind of economic boom in the Petch Valley. But now the fighting has come down to challenge it. Um, and that's the point where these are no longer, you know, the little... The outposts are no longer the center of kind of bubbles of security for the population. Really, they are bubbles of danger. They are th- these outposts are drawing in the fighting um, rather than, you know, p- providing security. Well, we should talk for a second, too, when you say they're drawing in the fighting, because it is it, uh, if you build it, they will come type right. scenario. Yeah. The fighting in your experience and your research there. Who was doing the fighting on the other side? Is it the locals? Is it Taliban? Is it people? We should also kind of unpack a little bit, I think, where the patch is. Yeah. Um, maybe we should have done it two hours ago. But <laughs> to put the flag in the ground, and you can provide much more detail to me, it's on the eastern side of the company or country. Most people would probably be surprised how close it is to Pakistan. Right. Um, you know, Afghanistan itself, you know, bordered on the east by Pakistan, west by Iran, a bunch of other stands up north, Turkestan, Uzbekistan, what else is up there? Tajikistan. Tajikistan There's some stands. Yeah. There's some stands up there. So it's surrounded by all this. Um, but the Pesh itself, east of Kabul, north of, and it whips up north from Jabad to Abad up the valley. Correct? Right. 
good yeah. enough for yeah. to plant the flag in there? So it's about um, this place is about a hundred miles northeast of Kabul. Um, not right on the Pakistani border, but pretty close. Pretty to damn it. close. Um, Which is why I asked who's doing the fighting yeah. because foot traffic, hundred percent possible. Right. So, uh, and that's the big question as U.S. forces are, you know, living there over the years is who are we fighting? And it's not obvious to most of the U.S. units that are up there. And some of them have very, in retrospect, wrong impressions of who they were fighting. You know, the assumption, because uh, in the, initially they're not fighting anybody, right? I mean, the first U.S. units that go up there in 2002 don't really get in firefights or anything. I mean, they, they're hunting for basically fugitives. Um, yeah. And they're, they're, the Taliban was, you know... The, the Taliban and al-Qaeda were not really in Kunar before 2001. It's kind of an important thing to, to understand about this, right? Like, down in Kandahar, southern Afghanistan, that's the Taliban heartland. They're dug in deep there. Um, it's where they had hosted al-Qaeda and its training camps and everything. But there were no al-Qaeda training camps in Kunar, and there was no real Taliban reach in Kunar. They had kind of, they had gotten control of the provincial capital uh, in, in the couple of years before 9-11. But out in the patch, they had never managed to bring things under control. They had kind of gotten some local strongmen to take their side, but other local strongmen were fighting against them. So it's not like this was, you know, natural Taliban country. In fact, it's um uh the there's a there's a high proportion in Kunar of people who are Salafi Muslims, which is uh, a, a whole different strain essentially um of Islam than the Deobandi strain strain that the Taliban comes from. So there are kind of real ideological differences between what people believe up in Kunar and what the Taliban believe. And sometimes this can look like very superficial things. Yeah. Um it can look like um you know what people do with their hands when they pray. Um but it's deeper than that. But didn't the Salafi branch also uh wasn't Dish or Daesh born out of that as well. Yes, yeah, exactly. And so that's you know I think we may get to this later if we have time. But there's eventually sort of the the coda to the to the to the story is that eventually, um, it, even though uh, this area never really was a natural fit for the Taliban, uh, eventually it becomes quite a natural fit for ISIS. Um, and that's that's the story of kind of the more recent years in the patch. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, but yeah, so essentially, you know, U.S. troops show up there. There's not an insurgency right off the bat, right? Um, there's there's a pretty strong willingness in Kunar uh, among people to deal with the Americans. Um, but, you know, they make mistakes. They detain the wrong people. They kill the wrong people. Um, there are some really famous instances of it that people still talk about today. Um, and over time, there starts, you know, some people start to take up arms um, just out of sort of anger at, you know, what they see as abuses by, by U.S. troops, mistakes by U.S. troops. And then the Taliban capitalizes on that. Um, so in 2005 is when you really see the Taliban come into Kunar and kind of attach themselves onto this growing local insurgency. They, they were winning or fighting a campaign for the hearts and minds just like we were. Right. And um, there's, you know, one of the key things that you see is, um, you know, U.S. forces make mistakes. Some of these are just, you know, com- just um, heat of the moment, battlefield mistakes uh, that would, could happen to any kind of unit. But some of the more, some of the worst things are when U.S. forces essentially get used as proxies by the local allies that they're dealing with. Are um, you saying <laughs> that maybe one family would hold a grudge against another <laughs> right. and then come in with some hot intel that might be one of their family enemies compounds? We fought with this in Iraq. It happened in Afghanistan. Yeah, trying to separate the wheat from the chaff of like... Is bin Laden really staying at your neighbor's house or right. three generations ago did he kill your goat? Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and Kunar and the Pesh are rife with examples about this. Yes. You know, they, it happened all over Afghanistan and Iraq as well. But it can be really hard to find good examples of like, oh, actually, actually this was the grudge. And this was, you know, and, and the, the CIA got told to do this uh, and it believed it and it did this and it was a disaster. Um, one of these examples, uh, I'll give two examples. Um, one is uh, the town of Iran's where the ranch house battle winds up happening in 2007. When those paratroopers and 10th Mountain guys show up there in 2006, 2007, there's already an American legacy in that valley that they don't know about. Because in 2003, um, uh, the CIA's local informants had told it, uh, had told the CIA uh, that Gulbuddin Hekmatyar was staying at a compound 
uh, near Iran. Skobin and Hekmatyar is a former prime minister of Afghanistan, a very sort of radical Islamist warlord, basically, who was tight with bin Laden and who we know in retrospect, in fact, was the guy who helped facilitate bin Laden's escape from Tora Bora and escape from Afghanistan. So the idea that where Hekmatyar was, bin Laden might also be was not crazy. The CIA and JSOC were on the right track with that. Uh, but in this instance, uh, on, on October 30th in 2003, um, the CIA gets played by its local sources into bombing a place where Hekmatyar is not. Uh, and in fact, uh, who does live there is the family of a, a really prominent uh, person who was exactly the wrong person to uh, you know, make enemies with. Um, a guy named Mulawi Ghulam Rabani, who was this really respected kind of elder figure in Kunar, who uh, in the past had been kind of a peacemaker between Mujahideen factions when they would get at each other's throats and fight each other. He was kind of the guy that everybody respected uh, up in, in Nuristan province, north of the Pech. But what it what seems to have happened um, is that, uh, you know, the, the CIA, when it came into Afghanistan, um, it inherited... Uh, basically the intelligence apparatus of the Northern Alliance, the, you know, the, the Northern Afghan factions that it had been dealing with against the Taliban uh, in, in the years before 9-11. Um, and this, this kind of, this intelligence apparatus, uh, a lot of it consists of, strangely, um, people who had been trained by the KGB uh, in the 1980s and 1970s as part of the Soviet-backed communist government's intelligence apparatus. Um, and what winds up happening in 2003 is two of these KGB trained guys who had been on the communist side during the jihad, they back then had been opponents both of Hekmatyar and of Malawi Ghulam Rabani because both of those guys were, were fighting in the anti-Soviet, anti-communist jihad. Um, and they see an opportunity uh, in, in the fall of 2003 when the CIA is desperate to find out where bin Laden has gone, to find out where Hekmatyar is. They see an opportunity to settle a grudge. Um, and this is this, um, you know, this isn't this wouldn't make it through a court of law, but it's a uh, it's a it's a pretty, um, you know, I, I know the names of these two guys. Um, they they were members of the NDS, the CIA backed National Directorate of Security. Um, they, you know, they people saw them in the valley, you know, around the time, uh, and they. I should make clear that, um, you know, the, the CIA and the military they were really strapped for people they could trust up in these valleys, right? Because it's a really linguistically diverse area. Like just having somebody who speaks Waigali, not easy. So if you've got somebody who speaks Waigali, uh, it's pretty easy to put all your eggs in that guy's basket. Uh, and that seems to be what happened in this Especially case. if they're telling you what you want to hear. Right. They're telling you what you want to hear. Um, you've got, you know, pressure uh, from from the Bush administration back in D.C. to kind of, you know, we've like, shit, we've we've dropped the ball on, on bin Laden. We've got to pick it back up. Um, this pressure is filtering down through Secretary Rumsfeld. It's filtering down through George Tenet, the CIA director. Um, uh, and, it, and it filters down to this this decision uh, in, in October 2003, um, which actually both um, uh, diplomatic and military sides recommend against doing this airstrike because they think the intelligence is, is dubious. Um, but the pressure is such that the CIA does order the airstrike. Um, it kills quite a bunch of uh, women and children in this in this family. Um, and this kind of becomes the original sin of U.S. involvement in the Weigel Valley. Because, um, you know, there are no U.S. troops on the ground at that point. This is just a thing that has happened from the air. And then three years later, when U.S. troops do show up in the Weigel Valley to stay and to build outposts, they don't know anything about this because this wasn't a military operation. It was a CIA operation. All they know about it is what local people tell them. And they don't know whether to believe that, you yeah. know, any more than the CIA guys knew whether to believe their sources. Um, so that's one example of kind of U.S. US air power being used to settle a score. Another is the Korengal Valley, where, you know, what you see in Restrepo, um, you just you just see U.S. troops and, and insurgents who are sort of presented as Taliban duking it out. That's what you see. In the background, sometimes you see piles of lumber, and those piles of lumber are pretty important because they're really the reason that the U.S. troops wound up stuck in the Korengal Valley. And it's this story of uh, U.S. troops being brought in as muscle by people who had a commercial relationship and dispute with Korengali timber merchants. Um, and then the Korengalis, in return, bringing in the Taliban as muscle. Uh, and, and then it kind of becoming this arena in Fuck. which in which the, the <laughs> Taliban and the U.S. duke it out in this place because it's they're there and it's convenient, uh, but in which both sides really have been, have been respectively brought in um, as part of this commercial dispute over 
uh, this this cedar wood that is. Uh, you know, very, very valuable. I didn't realize what role that would play in the economy of the corn gall. Yeah, I mean, I didn't either. I, you knew a lot of the infantry companies that fought up there. They knew. I mean, they knew it was inescapable that this was that this conflict had a lot to do with the cedar. I mean, you could see it all around you. The outpost that they were living at, the corn gall outpost, was a lumber yard of one of these. Yeah. You know, the big the big timber baron of the, of the valley. So you knew, and it was very very clear that the you know that the the people selling the timber were also the people fighting you. Uh, but the sort of the complexities of what role it was playing took a long time for the military to figure out. It really took them until they had left to to, to figure it out. Um, and in the meantime, um, you know, it just it, it's it's a dynamic that got them sucked that sucked them deeper and deeper into the Korangal uh, yeah. as they went along. What year did it switch more to an air campaign, or I should say, not necessarily <clears throat> even air, uh, a remote strike campaign? Yeah. So um, U.S. troops finally pull out of the patch in 2011. Um, they kind of get sucked back in again uh, later that year. Yeah, because they tried to do a handover to the ANA, right? Right. So they try to hand things over to the Afghan National Army in 2011. They, in fact, do that, but then the ANA fall apart, uh, and U.S. forces are brought back out into the patch in kind of a more limited advisory capacity, and it takes them a couple more years to then fully to extract themselves again, having sort of set the ANA up to do a better job. Um, in the meantime... Um, uh, well, the conventional forces are doing this on the valley floor, leaving, going back, leaving again. Um, JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command that Dev Grew and the Rangers and Delta Force all work for, um, it uh, starts this air campaign called Operation Haymaker um, up in the mountains surrounding the Pesh. And the reason it does this is that there's sort of this irony um, in the story where, you know, U.S. forces went up to Kunar in the first place, JSOC guys, in 2002, trying to find bin Laden and other Al-Qaeda operatives. They didn't find him um, because they were only passing through. Uh, but then in subsequent years, because the U.S. presence in these valleys snowballs and spirals out of control and all this fighting happens and it draws in the Taliban, then the Al-Qaeda guys start to show up because this place becomes like this um, gladiatorial arena um, by 2009, 2010 uh, for a very picturesque combat that's great for propaganda videos, great for kind of proving your bona fides. Um, Much like Iraq, people coming, flowing through Syria or making their way there. Basically, anybody who wanted to fight Americans, it wasn't very hard to find them. Exactly. And there's a a, uh, a Qatari national named Farouk al-Qatani who, he comes there as a young, a young Arab um, who wants to sort of prove himself uh, as an al-Qaeda operative. Uh, and he really does prove himself. He's you know involved in a lot of fighting against American troops in 2009, 2010. Um, and when um, Red Squadron of Devgru kills bin Laden and drags a bunch of documents out of his compound, um, one of the things that we find out that the CIA finds out from the documents, and many of these documents have since been declassified, which is you know why I was able to use them for the book, um, is that at the time of his death, um, bin Laden and his senior senior sort of senior subordinates who were in the Waziristan tribal region where the CIA was hunting them with its own drones. Um, they really were feeling like Waziristan was not going to be a sustainable place for them to continue running Al Qaeda from because of the CIA drone campaign. We should describe what Waziristan is because it doesn't even show up on a map. Yeah, North and South Waziristan. They're they're parts. They're the federally administered tribal the areas. The fatwa. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, and so let's just call it the Wild West. <laughs> sure. Where Pakistan and Afghanistan are both like, yeah, that's ours, but at the same time, we don't want any part of this. Right, and where it's the, the, and where, and where the U.S. military can't go, correct, with very rare exceptions that yeah. involve your former unit. Yeah, um, but if you do go, <laughs> stand by because there were often uh, very committed, very serious individuals were ready to receive you. But so what this leads to is, you know, during the first term of the Obama administration, um, the CIA launches this really ferocious drone campaign against Al Qaeda's sanctuaries that it's built up in this part of in Waziristan. In Waziristan, okay. Um, and so that's where you know this sort of the, the drone war that we all think of from from the Obama era. It's focused on Waziristan, and it really um, you can see in the correspondence between uh, Bin Laden and his kind of middle managers uh, that it was really having an effect, uh, and they were they were very constrained in what they could do uh, when they could go outside, even to like practice on the rifle range or something. Hmm. I mean, they just they were they were you know it was it was tough to live there. They were feeling the pressure. Um, they were really feeling the pressure, and in these documents you can see them talking about well. The American military is pulling out of this part of Afghanistan uh, called Kunar, Kunar and Nuristan, where the Pesh Valley is. We've got a guy up there. His name's Farouk. He's a good guy. Um, maybe we can start relocating some of our some of our leaders mm. up there. 
Uh, and this is this is revealed in the uh, what they call the docx, the document exploitation, you know, dump of files um, that gets pulled out of the Abbottabad compound. Um, and it's it's very inconvenient, right, for the United States because it's okay. So just as we have gotten fed up with this horrible part of Afghanistan, we're realizing that actually maybe our number one target on the Afghan side of the border is in it, and maybe he's going to be bringing in other, even higher, bigger fish from the Pakistani side of the border. So at the same time that the mili- that the conventional military is washing its hands of the patch and leaving, um, the CIA is telling uh, is telling JSOC, hey, you guys have to think of some other solution for this for this kind of wild part of the country with all the forests and everything like that. Um, and there's a, uh, but it, it comes at this time when. You know, for the for the generals and admirals in charge of of JSOC, they know this place and they don't like it um, because they've pretty much anybody who's been there <laughs> doesn't right. like it. And they've by this point they've lost a lot of guys up there. Yep. You know, I mean, there have been not just in combat either, right? There are just there are endless helicopter crashes just because of the the terrain and the trees and the weather. It's just a it's just a really really dangerous place to operate. So there is this scar tissue that's built up in kind of the JSOC leadership um, where they say, okay. We're not we're not leaning back into, you know, ground raids up in up in the tributaries of the Pesh Valley. Been there, done that. It's too it's too dangerous. The, the juice is not worth the squeeze. Yeah. But so at this moment, it sort of happens to be when, in part because of the CIA air campaign in in, uh, in Pakistan, sort of the technology and tactics of drones um, and the you know the surveillance and strike complex that uses drones have really matured to a point where. You know, it's still not an all-seeing eye by any means, but it's a lot better than it was early in the war. And it's good enough that the JSOC leadership decides, okay, this is going to be our tool from here on out uh, in these mountains, is we're going to do this the drone way. Yeah, uh, it uh, it certainly does reduce the risk to a lot of the other things that you mentioned. It has real drawbacks, though. Um, of course it does. And one of these is... Um, you kind of you pretty quickly uh, stop having good intelligence because you're incinerating the intelligence as you do these yeah, strikes. Destroying everything. You're not taking detainees. You're not gathering documents. You're just whacking people. Um, and this, um, you know, with op- when Operation Haymaker starts, there are, there are some initial really exciting results. Like in 2012, they kill a bunch of genuine Arab Al Qaeda guys up there. Not Farouk Al Qatani, but people who know Farouk Al Qatani and work with him and are, are his associates. Um, and it seems like, man, this is really okay. Operation Haymaker is really it is making hay. It is it's really working. Um, but in the couple of years that follow, it kind of runs out of steam. They 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 run out of good targets. Um, they they you know the the guys they're looking for kind of find ways to ensconce themselves deeper and do their communication security better and all this. But the drone campaign keeps going, and it's just it's going after lower and lower level people. It's kind of working its way. It's just it's hitting what it can hit. It's a hammer searching for nails, almost in the same way that the conventional infantry battalions were hammers searching for nails earlier in the war. Um, only now there aren't Americans. You know, dying as part of it, which in some ways, you know, from an American perspective, makes it very e- much easier to just to keep it going. Yeah. Um, so they're kind of they're just hitting lower and lower level guys. You know, we can't find the Arabs anymore, so uh, we're gonna you know go after the local guides who help the Arabs move between valleys. You know, uh, this month there's you know there was a one. Um, JSOC officer who's quoted in the book describes, look, it, it eventually became, if the only guy we could find on SIGINT that month was like a machine gunner, then we'd call him objective box cutter and we'd, you know, use the nation's resources to kill him. Um, <laughs> and so there are these kind of diminishing returns with Operation Haymaker. Um, but eventually they do get their guy. It just takes a long time. It's yeah. In 2016, in the final weeks of the Obama administration, they do kill Farouk al Qatani. Um, who had been kind of a, a real sort of high-level source of alarm um, among, you know, the the CIA deputy director at the time was very alarmed about Farouk al Qatani. There were kind of there were hints that he might have been uh, using these mountains north of the Pech to bring in, um, you know, bring in people from Pakistan to train not just to fight in the war around there, but to do international attacks with, which was the you know that's the the thing that. Um, makes any individual Al Qaeda figure rise to the attention of the national, the leader. national, you know, national level. Was it a haymaker strike that got him? I think by that point they were no longer calling it haymaker, um, but it's same a continuation mechanism. of the same operation. Yeah, yeah. I was shocked you know, when I was reading the book at how many of those strikes actually occurred. The frequency with which they were able to uh, 
metaphorically pull the trigger on that. Yeah, I mean, in tw- 2013 was the somewhere. peak. 2013 was the peak, and it was really, it was like, it was the same pace, really, uh, that at the height of the CIA campaign in Pakistan. It was like, it was a real air campaign. It was a... Uh, um, it wasn't all. It wasn't necessarily all drones doing the strikes. I mean, there are F-15s and F-16s yeah. involved in this also. But it was a real air campaign um, that um, that JSOC, that Rangers and SEALs were running, which is something that you know I think can be strange for people who have sort of conceptions of what what special operations forces do and what they look like that kind of are based on like. Black Hawk Down and the Bin Laden yeah. raid and stuff like that. Well, um, they still do those things. They still do those things. In that particular instance, that's not what was called for. But a huge component of what they of what they have done over the past decade, in particular, is run these air campaigns. Um, and that's you know that's a large part of what these you know Ranger Regiment and SEAL Team Six headquarters were doing uh, in Afghanistan during these years was um, you know was finding these targets and ordering airstrikes on them. So explain to me the. Evolution. How do you say it? Is it Daesh? Daesh? Um, Daesh. How, and, and how they came to come, or how they came to be in the Pesh? Yeah. So I'm just going to call it ISIS. Um, for, Perfect. Uh, you know, for 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 simplicity here. Um, uh, so we were talking a little earlier about how uh, the people in Kunar and the Pesh they have this. There's this different religious flavor to them uh, than the Taliban has, uh, and the religious flavor that exists up in Kunar um, is Salafi flavor. So it's kind of like real, um, like l- we want to exist on principles of from the time of the prophet Islam, um, and it actually was influenced by Saudis um, because you know as, as as far as the Pech is from Saudi Arabia, uh, a, a fair number of Saudi fighters had come and fought there during the jihad against the Soviets in the eighties, mm-hmm. and also a fair number of Kunari commanders uh, in the Mujahideen had sought Saudi money. Um, and and uh, Saudi backing, uh, and and as part of that, had adopted this Saudi style Salafism. Uh, this is also where the Daesh ideology comes from. Um, so, what happens is, you know, you've got all these local commanders running around Kunar who they've made alliances of convenience with the Taliban because they're both fighting the Americans. They may even have formally joined the Taliban in some cases, but they're not Taliban like. You know, Kandahar, Taliban, Heartland, Taliban. Uh, and when in 2015, 2016, um, the Islamic State arrives on the global scene, um, and, and they, they sort of, uh, it's a natural opportunity to, to raise the black flag uh, of the Islamic State, lower the white flag of the Taliban that you were only flying out of convenience, uh, and kind of embrace this movement that is more, uh, more your speed for some of these people. Um, so you see, you know, sort of, sort of small time local commanders who had been fighting U.S. troops. Uh, you start seeing them appear on like Treasury Department, uh, you know, ISIS sanctions lists. And it's this strange thing because it's on the one hand, ISIS is a it's a global terrorist organization like Al Qaeda. But on the other hand, the, the particular form that it takes in Kunar and the Pech is much more of just kind of a rebranding of a local insurgency. Um, it's the the same old guys um, that we've been fighting up there now calling themselves ISIS. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, though. The Taliban and ISIS don't see eye to eye. They do not. Um, not at all. Um, and so what winds up happening is um, in the more recent years of the conflict, I mean, since the U.S., since U.S. troops left on the ground, it's been this three-way struggle between the government, the Taliban, and ISIS all fighting each other. And the Taliban and the government sometimes reaching accommodations with one another to fight against ISIS, and it gets weird enough that um, so in in you know in, in February 2020 the Trump administration uh, made the Doha agreement with the Taliban to allow for a withdrawal from Afghanistan, and that's you know basically the framework under which U.S. troops are now as we speak tearing down Bagram Air Field and withdrawing from Afghanistan. Um, but in the months leading up to the Doha agreement, there was this weird thing going on where. At the same time that the JSOC task force and U.S. air power were hammering the Taliban in every other part of the country to try to kind of bring them to the table in Doha, get them to agree to favorable terms, uh, in Kunar, in some cases, they were using their same old intelligence collection tools not to strike the Taliban, but to figure out what individual Taliban commanders needed at a low level against ISIS and then deliver that to them. So what you're saying is, to a degree, removed... Perhaps U.S. weapons of war aligned with the Taliban to fight ISIS. Yeah, I mean the the <laughs> Rangers, the, ra- the the Rangers at Bagram, they joked that the particular little uh, Team East, they called it, the little cell that was doing the 
you know, the targeting up in Kunar, they, they, they jokingly called it the Taliban Air Force. Um, and they joked that the- I know, can't even wrap my head around <laughs> this. It was one, it's, uh, spoiler alert, this is one of the last things he talks about in the book. When I read that, I had to reread it a few times. Like, okay, <laughs> wait a minute. We are now providing air cover to a degree to the Taliban, an organization that has fought the United States tooth and nail in the Pesh Valley for a decade and a half, coming up on two decades. Okay. You can imagine this kind of, you know, offering a <laughs> queasy feeling to the Ranger NCO in the in the jock who, <sighs> yeah. you know, who's who's spent his whole whole career fighting the Taliban, right? Yeah. Um but you know, when I was interviewing guys about this development as I was finishing up the book, I mean, um, you know, w- w- one of the things that one of these one of these rangers said was, "Hey, like, look, it, it, everybody would like to be out there fighting the war still, but we also recognize that it hasn't been working. Yeah, um, and that you know there may be some more creative solutions required. Now, whether that's the a good solution or not, I mean, I think there's a big um, uh, there's a big gamble uh, on on sort of which is the greater danger to the United States, um, the the Afghan branch of ISIS, which it's a branch of a local of a, of a global terrorist organization, but it really is this kind of very local localized flavor mm-hmm. uh, of that terrorist organization. Or is it the Taliban, which continues to host Al Qaeda just like it always has? Is there an option C? <laughs> because option A and B both suck. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, option A and B both suck is kind of is certainly the situation that um, you know that we're in in Afghanistan, right? That the United that yeah. both the Trump and Biden administrations have faced is that I mean we can continue what we're doing, which isn't working, obviously, um, or try something new. Try something new. The something new may may make it much harder to strike anybody inside the country. Yeah. What was it about the patch that got you? in a place where you wanted to write a book about it. Of all the places in Afghanistan, why there? Um, it was, I mean, the combination of just how kind of unique the fighting was. Um, the interest, you know, the interesting kind of moment that I first visited at where it was U.S. troops are, you know, spreading out and being aggressive everywhere else in the country, but they're kind of recognizing that this same strategy has failed here in this part of the country. And that, that was kind of a, you know, a, a dichotomy that I, that I was interested in. I mean, initially it wasn't that I, that I wanted to write a book about it. It was initially, it was just like, I wanted to find out how each of those outposts got there. Like how did Cop Michigan get there? How did Fob yeah. Blessing get there? How did the Asadabad base get there? Because when you visited in, in 2010, nobody could really tell you. Um, you know, I mean, the, as far as the company commander at Cop Michigan is concerned, or the first sergeant or whoever, um, Outpost was there when they got there. Uh, it was there when the company commander and first sergeant before them got there. Pretty sure it was there when the company commander and first sergeant before them got there. Um, and beyond that, I mean, it kind of doesn't matter to the, you know, to the execution of the job that they're doing, which is a difficult enough task you know, on its own without thinking about how did this get, you know, doing a research project about how did this get started. Um, but that's what I wanted to do was figure out how and why each of these outposts got built. And it wound up being this much more complicated and interesting story than I was expecting or anticipating uh, in terms of, you know, the role of the CIA and JSOC in trying to figure out where bin Laden had gone. Yeah. Uh, and then the way that that almost with a mind of its own just snowballed into bigger and bigger and more ambitious uh, versions of the mission. What do you think it looks like? Uh, we'll talk about Afghanistan as a whole in a minute, but just in the the Petch Valley, in that area, as the U.S. winds down their presence and leaves, you think they can hold it on their own? So it's interesting. I mean, in some ways, I think um, the the Petch always is a few years, a couple years ahead of everywhere else in Afghanistan. Um, U.S. forces really have already wound down their presence in that part of the country. They, they've been out for some time. Um, they did not go back in in any kind of substantial way during the 2017 to 18 to 19, um, you know, Trump administration mini surge. Um, so I think we're in some ways we're already seeing the post-U.S. presence play out in this part of the country. And in this part of the country, the government troops are holding on. Um, now, the question is, is that because of very unique circumstances in Kunar that are not applicable elsewhere in the country, one of them being the presence of ISIS, right? So in recent years, the Taliban and the government, even as they are at each other's throats all over the rest of the country, they have found common cause against ISIS in the Pesh. ISIS in the Pesh has kind of waned. Uh, it's largely been defeated and, and gone underground again. Um, so I think the question is kind of, will this, uh, you know, will that kind of quiet and calm 
um, that's that's been present in the past in the past couple of years. Uh, will that remain? Um, will the Taliban? I mean, does the Taliban care about the Pesh? Um, what we're going to see in the in the you know in, in the coming year, kind of what the Taliban prioritizes as it retakes territory, right? Mm-hmm. Like right now, um, there's a huge Taliban offensive going on in northern Afghanistan, a part of the country that, for most of the U.S. presence there, was pretty quiet and not really a place that a lot of U.S. troops did a lot of fighting. Um, but now it's you know really ferocious fighting going on up there. Um, what is what is Kunar and the Pesh to the Taliban? Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe in the big picture, it's not much to them, yeah. um, and, and it may be that you know for that reason the Pesh kind of gets spared. Um, then again, maybe not. I mean, in, in in March there was a big attempt to take one of the district centers in the Pesh, Chabadara district center. Um, so yeah, I mean, we'll see. What are your thoughts on the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan? Um, I mean, it's uh, it's it's hard to watch. Not because I, not because I don't want U.S. troops to leave, um, but just because this is kind of the the world that I've spent my adult life immersed in and watching. Um, and it's almost, it's hard for me, you know, I, I hear from Rangers who are part of the, uh, the, the, you know, basically the exit crew at Bagram Airfield. And that's just kind of mind boggling to me to think about Bagram Airfield being torn down. I mean, that, are they uh, tearing it down right now? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. They're just about out. I mean, all that's left now is, is, is Bagram Airfield, which they've got, you know, the deployed Ranger battalion is sitting around watching get torn down. Um, and then there's the embassy complex and the, and the, and the, Hamid Karzai International Airport in Kabul. That's what it's down to. They closed Jalalabad a couple weeks ago. Um, they closed Fob Dwyer down in Helmand uh, a couple you know, over the past couple weeks. Um, so it's really it's it's in the, it's in its final weeks here. Um, Have they closed Kandahar? Yep, Kandahar's gone. I mean, I wonder Trent. what they did with the Timmy Hortons there. And the <laughs> well, that fucking Domino's pizza. That had been that had been gone for a while. That had been gone for a while. I think that's actually the only Tim Hortons I've ever been to. Is the the, the one at the boardwalk on Kandahar Airfield. <laughs> Oh shit! I don't, but, yeah, we I mean, don't have time to get into all the food <laughs> offerings at the Outback Steakhouse in Kandahar. Yeah, even though there wasn't an Outback, people, I'm joking. It was TGI Fridays. <laughs> what do you think the future will hold for Afghanistan? Like, once the U.S. is up and out, do you think it'll go back largely to the way it was, even after almost two decades of us being there? I don't know. I mean, I think it's a really unknown quantity how how well the Afghan security forces are going to hold on once they really don't have U.S. air power backing them up. Um, I mean, they've had sort of a lot of test cases, um, but it's it's not real till it's real in terms yeah. of they're just not being air power to back you up. Um, right now, things don't look good. I mean, there are districts falling in northern Afghanistan like crazy. Um, there, are, the Taliban is sort of at the gates of some of some cities. Um, I I don't you know I, I don't know that that's a foregone conclusion that it's going to turn out that way that the Taliban is going to just roll into these cities. I mean, there definitely are Afghan security forces that are fighting really, really hard, as well as ones that are that are quitting. I mean, there there is an Afghan commando unit that um, uh, in uh, in a district called Dalatabad in northern Afghanistan this past week. Um, they you know it's a unit that uh, was you know U.S. trained, U.S. backed for all these years. Really good unit um, that fought and took really ferocious losses. They were sent in to take this district. They failed. They lost either 21 or 26 guys killed. Um, including their commander, a very charismatic figure who was well known in Kabul. Um, uh, so, I mean, there there certainly are uh, Afghan units that are going to fight really, really hard. I think the bigger question will be kind of how does the government use them? Does it uh, does it does it use them well? Um, does it does it waste you know or does it waste these lives? Yeah. What are you going to write about next? Um, I've got a a project underway um, that I, I'd be interested in talking to you more about, but that's about. Um, Basically, it's, it's some stuff that came out of the book, but that didn't really fit into the book about um, ways that organizational culture of different military units uh, has been affected by the war in Afghanistan. Oh, interesting. The wear and tear of it. Um, how, you know, just um, the wear and tear of it um, parallels to the Australian Brereton Commission report um, in terms of... Uh, what, know, that was the SAS, SBS guys? Yeah, their yeah. Australian SAS regiment that um, has, has, seems like it's going to have some guys charged with murder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so I've got I've got a, a project that I'm that I'm working on um, that's going to be a, kind of about that. I mean, culture and culture in different military units. What leads to war crimes? What leads to resilience against war crimes? Um, that kind of thing. That is a very murky topic. Yeah, you can say that again. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. 
Uh, but fascinating at the same time. I yeah. would love to. Yeah, we can talk offline about that if you'd yeah. like to. Um, the book was great, man. Thanks. I really appreciate it. How long has it been out? Uh, it came out in March. Okay. Um, it was it was going to come out in Real October. Real good job. Release a book in a pandemic. <laughs> Actually, maybe that's the best time ever to release a book. Well, it's funny. It was, um, you know, it was supposed to come out in October. But then there were these pandemic publishing delays because of like there could only be so many people in the publishing where yeah. printing warehouses and this and that. And I was like really pissed and upset that it got delayed. You know when it was like, you know, six weeks from coming out. Um, but then it got the publication date instead became March. And thinking of like the context that it comes out in, um, would I rather that it came out? You know, four weeks ahead of uh, you know the most contentious presidential election ever, <laughs> in which Afghanistan was a non-issue. Yeah. Uh, or would I rather that it came out? You know, essentially four weeks ahead of the Biden administration coincidentally announcing the withdrawal of U.S. troops from the country after all this time, uh, the timing has been good. I mean, the, the book the book ends, you know, basically a year before that. It ends with the Doha agreement in 2020. Yeah. Um, but I think there are and, there, you know, and there are a lot of unique things about the patch that don't apply in other places in Afghanistan. Um, but the, you know, the winding down of U.S. involvement there and questions about the future of U.S. involvement there have definitely made people interested. Um, and have drawn, you know, drawn some attention to it. Um, and it's been really gratifying to hear, you know, to get feedback, um, both from guys who fought in the patch and are reading this book, um, guys who fought in the patch and are giving copies of it to their dads or their wives or loved ones to kind of help explain what their war was about. Yeah. But then also it's been fascinating to see, um, you know, people who never set foot in the patch, but who see a lot of resonance with other places that they fought in Iraq and Afghanistan that in some, that couldn't look more different but where you see some of the same dynamics play out uh, and where, it, you know, they see their wars reflected in these pages as well. It's a great book, man. I can't thank you enough for making the travel out here to uh, really dig on, dig in on it. I actually learned more about that area by reading the book than I did in my time spent over there. Because like I said, I'm not exactly sure where I was most of the time. <laughs> right. Sometimes I was very positive. Other times it's just like, hey, wake me up and we're on short final. <laughs> so uh, where can people find you and um, the book? Yes. Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter. at uh, It's my handle is Wesley S. Morgan. Um, the book uh, you can buy anywhere. Uh, you know, buy it on Amazon. I prefer that you buy it at your, your local bookstore uh, or bookshop.org is a good venue for, you know, for buying books kind of through independent bookstores. By the way, it's called The Hardest Place. The Hardest Place, The American <laughs> Military, Adrift in Afghanistan's Petch Valley. I thought of that title. I, I'm pretty happy with that title. I like that title very much. Thanks. Yeah. Um, random side note, how did you meet or uh, come into contact with Jake, the guy who connected us? Um, he had read the book, and he and he sent me a note. Um, he said, you know, I liked the book. and The uh, power of connectivity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll let you close it out, man. Closing thoughts by Wesley. Um, I mean, it's it's been a weird time to have a you know a, a, a book that I worked on for a decade come out right as U.S. troops are coming out of Afghanistan and as Afghanistan is kind of back in the national eye. Um, it's it, in some ways it's you know couldn't have been more perfect timing. I mean, if I had closed the book out like two years ago, there would really not be a very satisfying uh, kind of conclusion to it at all. Uh, in some ways, there still isn't though. I mean, the book the book ends with basically in some ways the same question now. Um, that the Bush administration faced in the immediate aftermath of, of 9-11, which is who's the enemy uh, and how, how seriously do we take them, right? Um, yeah. You know, we've got Al Qaeda still in Afghanistan. We know that because they, they get rolled up by Afghan special forces units embedded who, and they want, you know, that are targeting the Taliban. Um, so Al Qaeda is still there. The Taliban hasn't broken from them. Um, the question is kind of how serious are they? Um, and what kind of Al Qaeda are they? Which may seem like a weird question, but I think is, um, you know, one of the lessons of, of the book and of Afghanistan is not all Al Qaeda is created equal. Like Abu Iqlas, the Egyptian guy that they chased for years, when they caught him, I mean, he basically turned out to be an Al Qaeda Green Beret. He was, he was in there training and advising local forces. He wasn't the big international boogeyman. Yeah. Farouk al Qatani, he's dead, you know, so we're never going to really know what he was, but he seemed to be more of the international Al Qaeda flavor. Um, so the question is going to be, you know, the Al Qaeda guys that are up there, what kind are they? Uh, and it, it's going to be a harder question than ever before to answer because we're losing, and in many cases have already lost, uh, the means of intelligence collection that we've relied on over the past 20 years to keep abreast of that question. Hopefully we don't find ourselves back there in the next 20. Yeah. Maybe leave it on that. We'll see. Awesome. Thanks for your time, man. Thank you. Okay, one's in from the north.
I've got the west bank of the river. Two's going to give it to you in the grove. Roger, give me that gun run. Wait a long that back, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to tune in, whether you're listening on an audio-only platform or you're watching on YouTube. I appreciate that you take the time every week to tune in. People ask me a lot, what can they do to help me spread the word? And the answer is actually embedded in the question. The biggest thing you guys can do to help me if you enjoy the podcast and you think it would be helpful to others is subscribe and share it with other people. And if you have the time, go on to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and a review. If you think the podcast sucks, tell me it sucks and leave a zero star review or the lowest stars possible. If you have a question, comment or suggestion, you can go to clearedhotpodcast.com and there is a contact me button right there, which will land in my inbox. And the last thing, if people are interested in helping out, what you can do is fly the old flag. And by that, I don't mean an actual flag because I don't have any of those. I'm talking about t-shirts or sweatshirts or hats, whatever it may be. Again, clearedhotpodcast.com, click on the shop tab and hopefully something in there looks like it would be an item you would like to wear around town. And then you could tell people what it is when they ask you. But that is it. The biggest thing I can say is thank you. I truly appreciate it. Until next time. See you.